welcome to the latest episode of the Vinyl and Celluloid Podcast. The spoiler embargo is over, and that means it's finally time to fully review the latest James Bond entry, No Time to Die. I'm joined by my good friend and fellow Bond fan, Phil Downs, to review six decades of 007. We'll be talking about all the six eras, our favorite and least favorite movies, the best Bonds, the theme songs, villains, and everything Bond-related. Stay tuned. Thank you so much for agreeing to be a guest on this episode. I know uh, we've known each other for several years and Bond has always been a a recurring topic, right? Um, How did you get into James Bond? Because I think I've never asked you this question. Well, thank you for inviting me on the on the podcast, Pedro. It's a, it's a pleasure, and yet, just like you, uh, I've got a lot. I've had a lifelong love of Bond, um, and I think the way I got into Bond is very similar to you. Um, it's through family. Um, so my family are all Bond lovers, and when I was a child, um, growing up in the north of England, it was quite a common thing for the films to be shown on television, uh, especially around Christmas. Um, I remember as a child, you know, recording them on VHS, trying to cut out the adverts. So my memory of the Living Daylights is still uh, interspersed with uh, Granada uh, adverts. But anyway, that's one for the Brits. Um, <laughs> And the first Bond I ever saw, um, this is a little bit of a, a not not as not as popular for some people, but it was on Her Majesty's Secret Service, and I think that's probably part of the reason that I am more attached to it than your average Bond fan. Oh wow! Um, I mean, yeah, I, I always thought um, I get we're pretty much the same age, so I thought you also started with the um, with the Brosnan era, right? Um, yes. Um, my second was Goldeneye, which again is is one of my favourites for obvious mm-hmm. reasons, and not just because I grew up down the road from where Sean Bean is from. <laughs> you never met him, sadly not. My friends have, um, but I haven't. Well, you need to hurry up because I don't know how many times they can kill him on screen and everything. Agreed. Does. Yeah, he is he is living on borrowed time. <laughs> that man. Cool. So I mean, um, let's just f- t- take that um, well that that little nugget for a while because you um, so on Her Majesty's Secret Service. That's uh, usually I don't know. Do you think it's people w- when they watch it, it's not Connery or Moore or whatever or well, it, it definitely I think isn't. It's a, right? I think it's a mixture of things. I think the press coverage at the time was quite negative about Lazenby. I think the fact that Lazenby was dubbed, wasn't he? Uh, mm-hmm. Or at least for significant parts of the film, um, that I think counted against him. Uh, there was, a, I think, a belief that he was chosen purely based on how he looked, um, yeah. which I think is probably part of it. Um, but for me, I think On a Majesty's Secret Service has more than enough merits to be considered among the good Bonds. Maybe not the best, but um, I, I, I will happily trot out to defend that film. Oh, yeah. I mean... Um... We'll, we'll get a chance to revisit that because we will also be talking about the latest James Bond entry, um, No Time to Die, right? Which uh, yes, I saw with you. And well, <laughs> we, we, we have recovered. Enough time has uh, gone by since we've seen it. So that's really, really interesting. And I mean, just on on that note about Lazenby, there's that amazing documentary, Becoming Bond, uh, where they they do reinforce exactly the the idea you just described, right? That he was chosen because of his looks and not because of his uh, acting background, because it was non-existent. But um, I mean, yeah, it's it's an interesting first step. I get. I guess mine uh, was uh, through the Brazen era and with with Goldeneye. I recall watching some of the promos on TV, but Bond was kind of like a staple, like. Um, Sunday afternoon, Saturday afternoon TV. Uh, they were always, they were always, uh, always airing uh, those movies and and beyond that all the year round. And also, when you went to rent a movie or or something, I mean, at le- you would have at least ten Bond movies to pick from, right? So there was. Speaking of which, Pedro, I have a question yeah, for yeah. you. Growing up in Portugal near Lisbon, <laughs> the Bond films. My understanding is that in Portugal. Uh, English language films are generally subtitled, not dubbed. Yes. Is that the case with Bond and Portugal? Yes, yes. It was never, never dubbed. I mean, the fact that it's the equivalent of P1 
PG slash PG-13, none of them were rated lower than that. Like, you would only get rated G movies, uh, the, the, only those kind of movies would get dubbed, right? I've never seen a dubbed uh, James Bond movie. <laughs> I believe License to Kill got a 15 rating in the UK, uh, but I think that's since been downgraded. Well, m- well, yeah, m- maybe I haven't I haven't checked that that one in particular. I thought that one was was quite um, was even more vi- violent, right? So it's a very violent film, License to Kill. It's very in with the kind of the well, it, it's, it's it's in the era of Scarface. Yeah. Uh, a bond always reflects the world around it and, and and the film kind of environment around it and at that time it was it was all about you know cocaine and, yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, cartels uh, and that sort absolutely. of thing absolutely and televangelists i recall uh, oh and, yes and, yes and all those scandals now we will we will get a chance to revisit that, the or to visit the dalton era in in uh, in a few moments but uh, no, no, none of them were dubbed, and and in fact, I mean, it was always that exactly what what I mentioned, right? It was something that was part of the um, part of the you know the family and uh, all your friends. Everybody was they would talk about the Connery era and and Roger Moore, and and so you always get an exposure to to different opinions and and obviously different ideas about what what is Bond and what defines. Uh, a great Bond actor. Um, I think. I think there's another thing that happened to us when we were young, and this is based on us growing up in the in the 1990s into the early 2000s. Mm-hmm. Uh, you and I are from the era of the Nintendo 64. Yes. I don't think we should underestimate the power that GoldenEye Nintendo 64 had because it's something that still, yeah. all of my friends that had Nintendo 64s, myself excluded, I did not have one, <laughs> but I did play GoldenEye with, with some of my friends. And it it was just one of the iconic titles on that console, which itself is an iconic console. Exactly, and and, and beyond that, uh, I, I guess not only as um, associated to to Nintendo sixty four, but also and not even to the James Bond um, canon. It's actually it was revolutionary, right? It was what absolutely influence you're more of a gamer than i am so correct well, me if i'm first wrong person exactly. sh- yeah if you if you go into the history of first person shooters um golden eye is incredibly important uh, and of course in terms of artificial intelligence design there is a classic level in in golden eye where you need to stop natalia from getting killed <laughs> and her the ai that was designed for her wasn't particularly good at i believe pathfinding which meant that she continued to run into enemy fire and it was known as being one of the most uh you know frustrating missions in the game and that's been known as the uh, protect natalia problem ever since oh wow if you if you if you are if you design game ai you need to prevent a uh, protect natalia situation so yeah a lot more impact than you think just on the surface i, I did not know that i mean i, I thought even from just a, a gameplay standpoint that was where the the revolution s- sat back in 97 when the the game was released but uh, i had no clue i will look into the protect natalia Right, always with great trivia, man. I, I made a note here. We'll, we'll look it up. Um, and, and and I mean, you mentioned it was so. Goldeneye was your your second uh, second Bond uh, experience or exposure to the franchise. And what was the the first one that you've seen on, on the big screen? Oh, on the big screen, I think it would have to be Tomorrow Never Dies. Wow. I think I was taken to see Tomorrow Never Dies, if I remember correctly. Y- yeah. Um, and it is. I mean, it uh, obviously there's, there's the general received wisdom that Brosnan's films decline over time. But I, I, I Goldeneye remains my favourite. Yeah. Sorry to do a little spoiler for our discussion later on. <laughs> but Tomorrow Never Dies is a solid entry, um, and Jonathan Price's uh, you know kind of uh, role as Elliot, Elliot Carver, Carver. I think he is absolutely fantastic. He is made for that role. He does it perfectly, and this is right in the era of Murdoch. It really, really reflects it beautifully. I think it's a fantastic film. I, I agree with you. I think uh, the first two, let's say even the, the world is not enough because it plays out the, the nostalgia aspect. Um, they're, they're very solid. Um, it was actually also like my first exposure was through, um, well, I got to see GoldenEye. We, my, me and my family were into GoldenEye on VHS. Um, and then I was taken to see Tomorrow Never Dies again with, with my family. And it, it's funny because, um, yeah, I guess Daniel Craig, uh, so... Casino Royale. That's when I uh, went st- started to go, or it was the first one I, I went to see with with friends. So uh, my um, big screen plus family experience uh, in in the world of Bond was always during the, the 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 Brosnan era. And I mean, when we look at your 
like you started with Lazenby, then immediately like another universe altogether with Brosnan. You you immediately have exposure to two very um, opposed visions of what is Bond, and I mean, what is it that taking this like the the first two movies um, th that you've seen and how different they are? What is it that you enjoy the most about the, the series, right? I think James Bond is a really, an almost perfect blend of action and style. Mm -hmm. Lots of films do action, lots of films do style. Bond blends the two in a way that most of the franchises can't or other standalone films don't. Mm -hmm. um, I also, it's an element, there's the word play in the scripts, and I'm not talking cringeworthy double <laughs> entendres. I'm to, I, I think there is genuine wit in many of the scripts. I think the fact that Bond... Uh, without exception, always goes to exotic locales. This is a an agent that travels. You know, he's MI6, not MI5. Uh, sorry to anyone who's listening who's employed <laughs> by MI5. Um, and uh, broadly speaking, there are some exceptions. The villains are usually quite interesting. There's there's usually a decent yeah. threat going on. Um, obviously, there are exceptions which we will discuss later on. Yeah. But I think it's action style. There's genuine wit in the scripts, the locales. Um, and also speaking as uh, obviously we are we are both Brits. So congratulations again on the naturalisation. <laughs> um, growing up in the UK, I think it shows an aspect of our culture to the world. Now, some people uh, re more recently have made more negative noises about it, but I think for the majority of us, I think we're quite proud of it, and I think that's with good reason. Yeah, I mean, uh, I I'm with you there. H having grown up as as a non-Brit citizen, um, it was it w it is kind of a cultural ambassador, if you will. Um, because it's it's probably outside of the like U.S. productions, um, probably the D character or D leading character um, that most people know, right? Um, so so and and I guess also part of it it's the that that cultural impact that Bond had in in the '60s, right? Uh, with with both the books and, and and the movies and during the Connery era, it was something that was very different, right? In terms of action, in terms of that uh, the style, and also a, a bit of substance, and even the um, the destinations, right? In in an era where it was uh, well, it wasn't as common as it is nowadays to to travel. You're quite, quite right. Bo Bond is a, is a man who enjoys the luxuries. Exactly. Uh, Ian Fleming was not afraid of dropping brand names. Mm -hmm. In fact, I would argue, p potentially, if you met somebody like that, you might find them a tad boorish. Uh, <laughs> you, you, you don't like name droppers, but Bond does do this. And you, as you say, Pedro, quite rightly, during the 60s, you know, what they, what, in inverted commas, what they might call the golden age of air travel. Yeah. What that really means is you are spending silly money on a ticket. And yes, the experience looked pretty good, but we, we mere peasants probably couldn't afford it. No. Um, but Bond does all of this. Yeah. And so you're, it, let's just say you're from... Um, a relatively depressed town in in, 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 a, in the hinterlands of whichever country you hail from, and you're watching this international agent going to all these beautiful places in style. Bond is always going to be a fantasy. It's not just about heroism. It's not just about espionage. James Bond is a fantasy. I, I completely agree with you, and I think um, it, it, obviously we will um, go into a bit more detail as we, we discuss the different uh, Bond actors or the different actors that played Bond. But I think it's part of that um, the, the 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 notion of fantasy and the fact that you grow up um, either during the Moore era or Dalton or or Brosnan, and then you get to see other actors, and there is that I believe. In most uh, in most entries, they the, the franchise is able to reinvent itself, right? And I think the that reinvention is catering to what is the current uh, not fantasy, but what's not only fantasy but also the the relevance, right? And you just mentioned License to Kill, nineteen eighty nine, the um, so the the whole situation or dealing with the DEA, drugs, uh, televangelists. So it was quite. Uh, quite hip quite now right and in, in most cases i think that's that's obviously part of the plot but also the way bond conducts himself is uh a bit uh it tries to be in touch with what uh what that fantasy or ideal is but we'll get to that a bit later but in, in your opinion do you think that that's also or do you agree with me that that's why the franchise was able to stay afloat for six decades 
Yeah, a uh, uh, reinvention is, is something you'd mentioned to me mm-hmm. earlier, and I, I couldn't put it better than you. Um, Bond never stays exactly the same. Mm-hmm. There are always innovations and experimentations, uh, and some of them are unsuccessful, but they thus far have not managed to kill the series. I mean, uh, <laughs> one great example for me, uh, my, my one of my least favourite Moore films, Moonraker. Yeah. It all goes a bit science fiction. I, 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 yes, I love science fiction, but I don't need it in Bond. And uh, I, you know, uh, which is why I'm. Uh, we'll go on to it later. Uh, the Bond franchise is able to re- recover from this. Go right. Let's bring it back to basics. Uh, let's do something else that's you know their feet firmly planted on the earth. Mm-hmm. Um, so the reinventions part are definitely, I think, the key part of Bond. Bond can't go stale. Bond's like a shark; just keeps moving. Mm. Um, but also, I think there's an element of timelessness in Bond. Um, heroism and espionage are themes that never go out of fashion yeah um you will always find new material on uh, that have heroic or espionage elements you always always um and i think also the fantasy element of of luxury of travel um i don't think we're going to be we're going to be letting go of that anytime soon um i, I think of myself as relatively well traveled but i still see things <laughs> that make me go oh what oh, oh what what if i could travel there what if i could do that and i'm pretty sure i'm not alone Indeed, and um, I, I mean, I was thinking more about the Aston Martin, but fine, traveling. Let, 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 let's stick with that, your. That's a good point. Yeah, <laughs> you, you, could, you could tell I'm not. I'm, I'm not the world's big, big, biggest car fan. Um, I, I'm very. I very much enjoy the aesthetics, even though I have. <laughs> given that I live in London now, I have not driven in some years. Um, do have, do have a driving license though, thankfully. I got that done before I moved to a city. Um, but yes, yeah, so the Aston Martin brand. I mean, my goodness, what, what what better brand ambassador for Aston Martin than James Bond? Exactly, exactly. No, no. In, in line with the, I mean, he did drive other cars. Uh, what was the 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 yellow one? And was it the Citroen? Oh, the C- the Citroen, Citroen TCV. TCV. Exactly. Um, I I, I spot. I, I was recently on holiday in Mallorca, and I saw one as it happened, owned by a retired Scotsman who'd moved out to Mallorca. And the first thing I said to him when we were talking about the car was, I've recently watched For Your Eyes Only, and he, his, his face just lit up because he knew exactly what I was talking about. He knew exactly the scene we were talking about. It's uh, probably one of the, in inverted commas, worst vehicles that Bond drives, but I think it's a pretty iconic little car. Yep, yep, that, that is correct. Hopefully you didn't, uh, you didn't drive it down a hill. Like, uh, well, as it happens, this chap did live right at the top of a hill in, uh, in Poyensa on the eastern side of the island, but mercifully he'd kept it in beautiful condition. Uh, okay, so you, um, so, 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 yeah, you were tempted, but you, you didn't act upon that. <laughs> oh, it was awfully tempting, uh, awfully tempting. Oh, uh, man. So um, I, I think one of, the, um, one of the key points that you mentioned about um, what is Bond, and it's a perfect segue into, well, taking a deep dive into the Connery era, it's... Um, a symbol of of the UK, right? Uh, not only the culture, but also national identity, if uh, if I may say so. Um, and do you, when, when we first get to see Sean Connery in 1962 and Doctor No, and we are exposed to all those elements, albeit in a smaller scale, uh, like you mentioned, uh, of the traveling, of a bit of the luxury lifestyle, the casino. Do you think that uh, those, even the first movie, Doctor No, is a representation of post-World War II Britain and to a certain extent Europe, a sign of recovery, a sign of better days ahead and this is, this is the future? Um, the 60s are, are, are an interesting time for the United Kingdom because it obviously post-war um, things have been pretty difficult. You know, we don't uh, abolish rationing for some years after the war. Um, there have been huge changes in the economy under Clement Attlee, the mm-hmm. uh, post 1945 Labour Prime Minister who wins in a landslide. Winston Churchill wins again in 1950, if I remember correctly. Mm-hmm. But going into the 60s, there are some difficulties, but you're just on the brink of an economic boom and a kind of an innovation boom, uh, what was later called the white heat of industry. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think w- also what you're seeing is uh, a United Kingdom that's finding a new, a new place for itself in the world. Um, after World War One, the United Kingdom was pretty much undisputably the world's biggest imperial power. Um, the United Kingdom leaves World War One with a t- with a horrific death toll, horrendous economic problems, but actually ends up with more colonial territory than it started with. With World War Two, it's the complete opposite. Mm-hmm. We begin the co- the era of decolonization, and the UK the UK government's constantly wondering: Can we afford this base there? Can we afford this there? Um, and it feels a bit like the walls are closing in. So. 
I think to have a film or film series where in the complete opposite of reality mm-hmm. an American character plays a supporting role <laughs> that I mean in the, in the shape of Felix Leiter that's quite unusual so I think it's both us psychologically adjusting to the reality but there's also an element of fantasy of thinking nah nah we've still got it we've still mm-hmm. got it um, and I think that will always be a staple of Bond that's a, that's a very very in- interesting perspective um, I mean, looking at the the, the Connery era, I, I always thought, yeah, uh, it, it's pretty much um, you know you get that that perspective that it's um, it's the post World War II recovery. It's uh, but also there there's a new threat, right? Uh, and when you look at all six uh, Connery movies, they all deal with the uh, destruction of a planet uh, through some sort of atomic weapon or other, right? Um, and so, I, I mean, at the same time, Connery, well, it's not, not Connery, but the Connery era represents a, a new danger, right? So if you're looking at Bond um, as an escape or a, a, a source of entertainment to, to, to leave your worries behind, you, you will kind of be confronted with a diluted and a bit, well, excessive uh, portrayal of the, the the world of the 1960s, right? When you go see those movies, uh, it, yes, right. I, I I think these are. It is a fantasy, mm-hmm. but it is not a fairy tale, and it couldn't be because there'd be no sense of menace mm-hmm. otherwise. Mm-hmm. There's got to be some stakes, of course, a- a- absolutely. Um, and I mean, um, we, we'll get to revisit Connery o- overall um, as uh, like his contribution to to the franchise. But in terms of the six movies. Um, What's your what's your favorite one from this era? Um, I'm going to throw a curveball out and say Thunderball. <laughs> and I have three main reasons, one of which is very personal to me. Um, one is the score. I think it's fantastic. Yeah. Um, although I must admit, having watched it uh, relatively recently, um, I, the, the audio mixing is a bit off and uh, the, the dialogue's too quiet and the score blows your head off. But I still thoroughly enjoy it. Secondly, uh, the Bond girl Domino probably one of the most beautiful in the series in my humble opinion uh, every time she's on screen i feel like i'm melting um <laughs> and thirdly a very personal reason is the appearance of the vulcan bombers ah. which were um which is a familial link for me because my late grandfather was a squadron leader in the raf and a navigator on board the vulcans um, and that was the uk's last fully independent fully british built um nuclear deterrent wow okay um yeah, I mean, uh, cannot have that, uh, or, or I, I don't have the, the, the relationship you have w- with the Vulcan, but I do recall the scene you're mentioning. Regarding Domino, I would rank her, uh, I, I don't think we're able to, to rank Bond girls anymore without being called misogynist or sexist. Uh, even though this is a podcast, it's mine and it's um, about Bond, uh, but I figured might as well um, navigate safer waters uh, aboard this disco volante of mine. Hey, <laughs> hey, nice reference. <laughs> um, but I have to say, Claudine Auger as, uh, as Domino is, 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 is amazing. Um, I always... I think, yeah, I do have a bit, you know me, I usually my type uh, blonde, but I do go for Karin Dor, and that's why my favorite one is You Only Live Twice, uh, part of it. Um, so she's a redhead, so that's kind of a, a bit um, off map for me, but uh, <laughs> I'm, um, no, no. It is a very good film. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I was thinking uh, Daniela Bianchi in from, from Russia with Love, she, she's amazing. Um, yes. I guess the, the least favorite one, probably because she plays a bit of an annoying character, is Jill St. John uh, as Tiffany Case in Diamonds Are Forever, but that's also... W- w- we'll get to that in a minute, why the movie doesn't work. <laughs> I made a note here. In terms of the score, it's interesting you mentioned about the audio mixing. Um, I, w- I was thinking you were about to say it's because of Tom Jones' uh, uh, grand finale while singing the uh, Thunderbolt theme song. still sit Welsh tones. I mean, yep. don't get me wrong, the, the man's got a set of pipes on him. Yep. Uh, he's very talented and one of, one, of, <laughs> yeah, one of our greatest living singers, without a doubt. Yeah. Um, but I think for me, it's, it, 
it, I think it's more kind of the instrumental part yeah, John uh, where, during the chase sequences in the Bahamas. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's something as simple as being pursued through a crowd, but you really feel the tension. Yeah. And of course, all the wonderful music in the various bars. I think it's just a really heady blend of things, and I really enjoy it. Yeah, I, I think, if I'm not mistaken, that was still, yeah, John Barry was still the go to composer. It's, it, I, I think, all of the, the, the themes and everything he created, there's one that's a recurring theme that plays in uh, Diamonds Are Forever, Moonraker, and in several other Bond movies. Um, you only live twice as well, but I believe the original uh, the, the 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 score suit was uh, created or composed for Thunderbolt, and I think it is a game changer. I, I'm with you, right? I I, I love Thunderbolt. It's uh, when you adjust to inflation. I think it what raked in seven hundred million. That's something that that's impressive, right? Seriously <laughs> impressive yeah. stuff. Nowadays, you you need to be Marvel or something to to do that. And, and, and back then, yeah, you had television as as uh, entertainment c- competitor, but it's 700 million in the US, it, it's still adjusted to inflation. You, you'll see it featured in the top 20 or top 30 highest grocers. And, and that's a tribute also to the, the innovation that was featured in, in Thunderbolt. Uh, the underwater sequences, for one, um, it was really unlike anything shot at the time. I... It must have been really difficult to do. I mean, I think I, 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 my Bond encyclopedia from when I was young <laughs> does detail how they did some of it. And it, I think to modern audiences, it's not quite as impressive because everything is, for starters, we're so much more ambitious these days. And secondly, the technology that we have available to us is so much ahead of what they had then. But you know, when, you've, when you think about it in context, <laughs> those are some incredibly well done scenes. Absolutely, I think, and, and I had this discussion when I was a, a guest a couple of weeks ago uh, in, in a Portuguese podcast discussing the, the movie Dune, uh, the 1984 version, and I, I was commenting on the visual effects, but I always tend to, if I am criticizing or evaluating a, a movie's visual effects and special effects, I'll always do so uh, looking at comparables from that period, right? I think it's yes, completely, you've got to. completely unfair to to judge something uh, or a, a 1965 movie if i'm not mistaken by 2021 standards um and, and well, you're yeah, absolutely one, right one good example would be um comparing the original die hard to the gunplay in it to john wick yeah i mean this is a total step change in how things are done this it's not a technological shift it's more choreographic yeah um and you know keanu reeves spent an awfully long time training for that um, because audiences expected, or they decided to present audiences with a bit more realism. Uh, mm-hmm. Both both films are excellent, uh, mm-hmm. but there is a complete step change in how that's been done. And I think, again, Wick is now influencing films in the same way that Bourne, which we'll talk about later, influences yeah. Bond. Exactly, exactly. And and I, I think that's one of the key things that we, we can conclude about the Connery era, and whilst we're talking about favourite movies uh, of, of this era, is the fact that the franchise really started as a, a trendsetter, right? As as a leader in terms of a new genre, which was the played out spy film or associated with film noir. Um, and in the 1960s, this was this was something brand new, right? Uh, it was a leader, right, in terms of this kind of entertainment. And b- being that leader, and also based on every single reason you mentioned why Bond is is such, such an icon and that's why my pick is actually You Only Live Twice uh, the, the fifth Bond movie released after Thunderbolt in 1967 and I mean it includes besides Karin Dor uh, all the um, all the elements that you mentioned right it has the first of all an, an amazing score second the exotic I, I think for, for me it's still impressive uh, the the whole, um, every single action piece set in Japan, and I've been meaning to go there for, for many years. So f- it, it's still kind of uh, living my my fantasy through Bond in that case, even if it's the the 1960s uh, Japan. And um, a- again, it's the the, the production value, uh, everything associated with with that movie that that makes me enjoy it um, quite a lot. And also the fact that, in my opinion, it has one of the best theme songs ever recorded uh, and definitely my pick for the the Connery era, the Nancy Sinatra uh, uh, song <laughs> it, it's a fantastic song I think, um, yeah I, we, I, I know we've discussed best theme songs with Connery before but uh, yes, I mean it is a superb 
theme tune. And I, yeah. I, going back to what you said about Japan, um, one thing I particularly enjoy is at one point when when Bond's in an open top car, they actually I, 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 I recalled reading recently they actually had to cut the top off that car and make it a a convertible because he was too tall. Yeah. Uh, Connery was too tall for this Japanese car and I have been to Japan, I've been very lucky I've been there <laughs> once, um, I am fairly tall, uh, yeah. 193 centimetres or 6 foot 4 in Imperial um, and yes, that is not a country that is built for tall people um, no. it, it, I encountered many amusing and some less amusing uh, issues whilst I was over there to do with yeah. my height um, uh, the first of which of course is hotel slippers, um, it's just wow. not happening it's just not happening <laughs> for me, I mean I'm a I'm a UK size 12 or 13 depending on the shoe i think that's it wow. that's a europe european 47 i do believe um wow. yeah good luck good luck in japan lads good okay luck. <laughs> so much like bond you were larger than life or if you will big in japan uh when you uh, were yes there. i mean it, it because um the japanese are getting an, an awful lot taller now due to i think i believe it's higher protein diets um uh I was not towering over people in Tokyo. Um, I was, t- I am tall. I was tall. Um, but when you go out to the countryside, that's when you really start to feel like a control tower or a chimney. Nice. Uh, <laughs> that was something. But nice. anyway, no, I, 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 for anyone listening who has not been to Japan, um, if you can, uh, you know, obviously, once the current crisis is over, it is a wonderful country with so much to offer. I highly, highly recommend it. Yeah, I mean that's it, it's on. It's been on my list number one, and I guess w- every every time I rewatch You Only Live Twice, I I do get the urge to go immediately. But current uh, the current situation won't allow it. Uh, so I'll, I'll have to rewatch You Only Live Twice again. <laughs> I, I, I guess from the the best of the era into the the worst, and I, I think here we we kind of see eye to eye, and diamonds are forever, right? Um, I, uh, one of the things I wanted to do a bit more of before I did this podcast with you was do a bit more revision in inverted commas. You know, go and re- go and think about Bond. Maybe watch a few things. Um, one thing I, I drew the line on <laughs> was rewatching Diamonds Are Forever. Um, I <laughs> recent I, about two years ago I tried rewatching it after I, I've seen it a few times, mostly when I was a child. Um, I can't get more than ten minutes in. It is so. I'm trying. I'm trying to f- fit the right. Find the right word. Campy. It's camp, but it, but not camp in an entertaining way. Not camp in the way Priscilla, Queen of the Desert is camp, which is a fantastic yeah. film. It's camp in the what you know, kind of what are you doing? What are you doing to Bond? Um, I, I've got friends who like it, uh, but I am someone who just cannot watch that film anymore. Um, I was just sad because there, there's some genuine talent in it, and some of the concepts are really sound. But it has to be. It's probably one of my least favorite Bonds. Full stop. It, it, it mine as well. I think usually it uh, it ranks quite low and sits with Die Another Day and Moonraker in every single rank I've read or um, any article I read when they go over the the franchise. I also uh, it, it, it's very interesting, right? Because after you only live twice, Bond didn't return for or Connery didn't return for um, on Her Majesty's Secret Service, and then he was persuaded uh, through. Uh, monetary incentives uh, to to come back a sixth time um, and I guess the movie tries like you mentioned to reinvent itself but become way too 70s right because at the end of the 60s by the time Connery leaves fine the the franchise is, is at an all-time high uh, they um, they're still relevant but a lot changed between 67 and, and 71, right? And and so the franchise felt the need to adapt to the... Yeah, I mean, the the, the villains, the, um, the the whole... I don't know, even the the plot, the the mafia thing, Vegas, I don't know, it's just uh, too much. W- what are your thoughts? I, I'm a, I completely agree with you, Pedro. I haven't mm-hmm. watched it that, all that recently, and yes, it, it just comes across... Uh, it, 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 it's, a, it's a shot and a miss, uh, Diamonds yeah. Are Forever, and I think maybe it's a warning... Uh, for 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 future producers of Bond, don't just bring back a big name just because you think it will work. And the same might also apply to football managers. But <laughs> uh, don't yeah yes yes Manchester United. I am talking to you. Um, yes, that's very topical for the, if anyone's a football fan. But. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, don't just bring back a big name because you think it's going to work. Uh, w- this maybe is more of a topic for later in the podcast, but I, I would like to see in future Bond not get so attached to big names just for the sake of it. Um, I, I, there yeah. are other movie franchises that pick less well-known actors um, who do very well. So mm-hmm. yes, w- mm-hmm. w- a topic for later. 
Yeah. No, no, no. I, I, I think it's, it's relevant because we are looking at the, the, the Connery era and when you, I don't know, it's just that, that, that movie, I'm not saying that it shouldn't have existed, it shouldn't have existed like that. I had the, I don't know, the opportunity, if you will, <laughs> to rewatch it this year uh, as part of the whole No Time to Die campaign, rewatch all Bonds. And I have to say, I still don't like the movie, and I don't think I ever did. I probably watch it like three times, maybe, uh, and three times too many, in, in, in my opinion. But it, it, it's done. Um, and, and I mean, it's one of the things we, we rank the, the top and, 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 the, and, and the bottom. But we, it, it's very interesting that both you and I, Bond fans, um, we didn't pick the ones that come to the fine. The Bond era, and I'm not talking about Doctor No, but actually the two follow-ups from Russia with Love, 1963, and uh, Goldfinger, 1964, which um, it, it's interesting, right? Because they are the ones that usually have the the best uh, reviews, the ones that they say that define Bond, the inclusion of characters like Q and uh, the gadgets and everything. But we we focus on actually the the other movies. <laughs> I think that's what comes with being very familiar with something. I think you also get the urge to choose something a little differently from other people. Fair that enough. might just be a product of, of our personality, our respective personalities. <laughs> um, uh, bond bond love, hipsters, bond hipsters. I, I, there's there's got to be an element of it. Let's be honest. Um, <laughs> it's so, uh, but that doesn't mean, however, that, ne- that we don't rate those movies. I mean, yeah. from Russia with Love and Goldfinger are iconic Bond <laughs> films. Um, so just for context, uh, obviously, Pedro, you know her very well. My fiancé uh, has not watched very much Bond before meeting me. Mm-hmm. And during our relationship, I, I've kind of tried to show her a few Bonds. And the first one I ever showed her was Goldfinger, because it is the one that everyone talks about. And yeah. with good reason. I mean, it is a it is a fantastic film. But I think... Because I'd recently rewatched a few of the Connery era, and you asked me to watch your favorite, I, I decided not to think about it too much. Just go with my gut instinct. What's the first word yeah. that came to my mind? And it was thunderbolt. thunderbolt. Yeah, and that's that's where we went. C- c- completely get it. Um, and, and, and and I mean, back to your point. One of the other reasons why, not that we are hipsters, but bomb hipsters, maybe we are. But um, uh, the 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 one thing that also defines, especially uh, G- Goldfinger, is the the introduction of the theme song, right? And uh, Shirley Bassey, uh, who went out to actually uh, perform or record uh, for in total three movies, I think. I'm not sure if there was an additional like uh, any sessions or she was. She, I think she was lined up to record uh, License to Kill, but but she ended up not doing it. How um, and, um, I mean, it was that introduction, right? Uh, which is something that, I guess even with time, that's something that became even more impressive and more of a staple in the franchise because it actually took, what, 50 odd, well, 50 years for a Bond theme song to win uh, an, an Oscar and um, 50 years plus to reach the top of the charts in both the US and the UK, right? So... It, it, it is kind of an additional commercial vehicle to promote the, the, the movie. And I, I, safe to say, I, I do enjoy uh, Nancy Sinatra. I, I think Nancy Sinatra's You Only Live Twice is amazing. But you cannot discard or get a second close uh, position to... Um, or a close second to, uh, to Shirley Bassey's Goldfinger. What are your thoughts on, on it, it, the, the theme uh, song? You and I are completely in agree- on agreement on this one, <laughs> uh, Pedro. It, it is... They're both fantastic themes, and I, I don't think I'd want to be forced to choose between them. Fair enough. And also one thing we may disagree on... Uh, we, we, we may agree... No, we do agree on um, Diamonds Are Forever, and that we'd, uh, we, we're not fans, but uh, we do agree that the theme song is actually one of the, the movie's highlights. <laughs> it's, it, 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 if anything, for it, me, it's, it's, the only. The only, it's the only good thing about the film. I, I really enjoy Diamonds Are Forever as a, as a theme song. Um, <laughs> I think it's a great theme song, but unfortunately, it does not it, quite redeem the film. It's it's the only thing, exactly, only positive um, highlight of the movie. And, and now, w- one thing, and, and I know Phil that uh, you also enjoy uh, keeping tabs on uh, what's being said or what's the current state of culture in in, in all its shape and form. Um, but Connery as James Bond, not only Connery, but especially Connery as James Bond, and even. 
Connery the actor and, and the person, uh, they've been a bit under fire and, and that's not a pun because <laughs> they were actually um, fans and um, casual viewers and modern audiences are assessing and looking at Bond um, through 2021 lenses, right? And while we see Connery uh, doing a superb job of um, infusing the character and bringing a character to life with the right blend of charisma and, and menace, uh, he kind of like plays out a bit like Don Draper, right? Uh, so, I mean, Don Draper is inspired by uh, Connery, uh, Connery's Bond. But in, in that sense, that it is a confident, um, impulsive and, and, and somewhat brash from time to time uh, uh, character. But um, we do have the, the misogyny, right? The, that comment and, and the violence towards women, right? That um, the Connery era is a bit known for. Yes, it's... If you watch... Connery era bonds with 2021 eyes. Some of the things they are going to great, um, and the top one is the misogyny. Um, you got as always, as we said earlier, with things like special effects and you know uh, and technology. You also need to view the past through the context in which it was made. You know, in those days, it was yeah. not as shocking. It was not as frowned upon. Um, but again, you know, also I think to some extent that's quite an authentic interpretation of Bond. You know. Bond, Connery's Bond isn't necessarily a nice guy. He's a ruthless womanizer who gets his missions done. I, I'm not sure you'd want Connery's Bond as a friend. Um, and I'm not just saying that with my 2021 hat on. I, I just think, you know, Connery's Bond, there's none of the softness of Moore or even perhaps, you know, Daniel Craig. Um, this is a quite menacing Bond. Without, He's definitely not a villain, but, you know, I wouldn't call him a nice guy. Yeah. No, oh, no, I, I I completely agree, and I, I think it's it's a, not that it's unfair to to look at the franchise uh, or, or the series and, and say, oh yeah, that's that's completely wrong. I think that there is a context, but but beyond that, that's also the I, I guess the reason why Bond connected and there was a connection between Connery and audiences is, is because perhaps it was exactly like that in the sixties, right? That's how people were, and, and more specifically, men, right? Well, yeah, I, 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 th I think violence towards women in those days was definitely nowhere near as frowned upon as it is now. It was, it was n definitely not as much of a social taboo. I don't think that's a particularly controversial point to make. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I was even going beyond that with the whole drinking and and, and smoking and and all those facts. Yes. Um. Oh, and James Bond, I think, is always going to be a borderline alcoholic. If he's not that, then it's a good. You know, if you find a teetotal Bond, I think you could make a good argument that's not Bond. Um, the smoking element has been quietly dropped. Yeah. Um. But again, I don't think audiences have missed it because I think yeah. in the majority of Bond's markets, the rates of smoking have gone down considerably. Yeah, um, and the, the 1960s audiences are no longer paying to uh, the admission price to, to go to the movies to see the movie. <laughs> no, exactly. Um, so, yeah. That's, um, yeah, a, a, very, a very good point. And I, I would say, I mean... Again, the Connery era for me, it, it, it is the um, what defined Bond and what 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 is James Bond. But um, again, the the foundation and the blueprint for for what we what we see today. And I'm not saying that there shouldn't be an evolution, but some of the elements uh, can ch can change. Some others should stay the same, or at least anchored in what we know uh, as James Bond, right? And I, I think this is this is a great segue into the second and probably the shortest uh, entry in our, our episode today, the Lazenby years slash year. Um, George Lazenby, who in 1968 was selected to replace Sean Connery, uh, signed a contract for, I believe, five movies, six movies, but only starred in one uh, on Her Majesty's Secret Service. And it was actually your first Bond movie, like you mentioned. Take it away, Phil. Uh, your thoughts on Lazenby, because there is no best or worst. It's the only one. <laughs> well, I think I've said before, uh, Lazenby's been reviled by, by many, and, and including at the time. And I am not convinced this is entirely fair. I think he is one of those Bonds that time has been kind to. Mm -hmm. um, so I think he plays the role quite well um, and you've got to bear in mind this is a Bond actor who is being asked to do something in the ending sequence, you know, the death of his wife that no other Bond actor has to do you know, no other Bond actor has to do this I mean yes Craig deals with the death of Vesper Lind but they, they, are, they have not just got married 
uh, he is still pursuing her. Um, I, th- I, I so I think the fact that that Lazy Movie was able to pull that off conv- very convincingly is definitely you know a good point in his favour. Um, however, the fact that he was dubbed at points, uh, maybe entirely, you might have to correct me on that one. Nowadays, that would be pretty much unthinkable. Um, I think you they, they would end up having to recast in that respect. But um, yeah, I, I think Lazenby has been Lazenby has been unfairly treated. Um, he is not the best Bond, but he is definitely not as bad as some people have said. I, I completely agree. I would even go a step beyond saying that. On Her Majesty's Secret Service, I haven't read the book, but it, uh, from all the accounts and every single thing I've read about the book versus movie, it's actually a very faithful adaptation. I, I may be wrong on this one, but uh, well, I, be- I-, I believe it is quite faithful. Um, but it- it's very interesting because On Her Majesty's Secret Service, and that's probably why I, I always enjoyed that movie. Not because it's the only time Bond sets foot in Portugal, um, but uh, also because it's everything I hope that... There are some flaws in that movie, but that was everything I was hoping to see corrected, improved, when I went to to see No Time to Die. Because everything was set up, like fans know, uh, everything was set up to get uh, a remake of On Her Majesty's Secret Service, or um, at least an adaptation, and, and we didn't. Uh, at the same time, I, I think the movie, um, the whole plot, like you said, it's, it, it, it's, it's. I don't even know how to explain it because it's unfair for Lazenby because it was very different from the the, the, the previous five movies uh, from yes. the Connery era. It was a radical uh, departure. It, exactly, it's it's the longest movie, uh, or it was the longest movie until Casino Royale uh, was released in 2006. But it was um, it was also very emotionally charged, right? There it was, was the uh, whole thing, even the whole relationship between Bond and Blofeld and and Spectre overall. Yes, right. So I think it really took a turn. Something that wasn't, I don't think it was slowly built during the Connery years. It just kind of happened, uh, and it happened really fast uh, yeah, during this yeah. movie. On Her Majesty's Secret Service is a bit of a flash in the pan in that respect. It, yeah. Even the theme the theme at the beginning, you know, no no vocals, yeah. all instrumental, and this feeling of dread, of doom, something is coming and you know it's going to be bad. And all the way through the film, it's building and building. I think there are two other core elements that make On Her Majesty's Secret Service a great bond, and it's not Lazenby carrying this. They are Diana Rigg, yeah. who is phenomenal. Um, it, 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 she's a phenomenal. She was a phenomenal she actress, was. anyway. May she rest in peace. Um, and also Telly Savalas. Yes. The um, this isn't my idea. I, I've taken it from somebody else. Timothy Stanley, a, a journalist uh, writing in the Daily Telegraph, described how. Telly Savalas' Blofeld uses his cigarette as an extension of himself. And it's something I'd always, oh, I think we'd all notice, but we never really put into words. And he's just, it, it, I've never seen a movie character use a cigarette in that way, ever. And I think it's really, really well done. It's a really key, it, the way he indicates things to Bond, the way he reveals his plan. And of course, you have the inimitable voice of yeah. Telly Savalas. That I, I actually would rank him as the best Blofeld. I think he is phenomenal. I was um, about I was about to to ask you that. Um, I, I I mean, to to your points, Diana Rigg, fantastic, and, and of course she was probably what the first uh, Bond act or Bond girl or or actress to be featured in a Bond movie with prior experience because she was a household name through the yes, the British TV show The, the Avengers. Avengers, not yes. not Marvel, uh, the original Avengers, no, the original bowler hat umbrella yeah, before before on. Uma Thurman uh, ruined the whole thing. Um, <laughs> Anywho, um, no, but she, she was she was incredible, and I'm actually looking forward to see her final performance in uh, Last Night in Soho. Uh, sadly, uh, the movie is actually dedicated to her, but uh, she added uh, so much to, to that movie, and I've actually seen her in the movie she starred immediately after uh, The Hospital, uh, an amazing uh, movie starring George C. Scott, um, and she she plays a very different character, but at the same time, not really as uh, Tracy Di Vincenzo. Um, so the kind of like free spirit of the of the '60s, you know. And I think that's um, see that's one thing that they got right with Diana Rigg and her take on on that character is the fact that she does represent the '60s, right? 
uh, oh, yeah. f- uh, be that female empowerment, be that the, the um, you know, attitude towards life. Um, I think she really represents uh, m- more than anything Bond produced in, in, in the, or was produced in the 70s. She really represents a, a, an era or, or a, an attitude that belonged to, to a certain era, right? I completely agree. I, th- I think she is, she is an iconic Bond girl. Um, I think there are some Bond girls who are kind of, you know, yeah. damsels in distress and so on, and, and quite rightly seen as a bit two-dimensional. She is, she is the complete opposite of that. She, she's got so much to her. You know, the, the, the frustrations with her father and the world that she's in, yeah. frustrations with Bond himself. I think, and the way Diana Rigg expresses it beautifully. I, I, yeah, I don't have a bad word to say against her. Yep. Yeah. Um, and, and to your second point, still on casting, uh, Telly Savalas, I've just recently, not because of this podcast, I was watching something, I don't know why, was it a joke or something like that, that they mentioned Kojak, so I watched a couple of clips, and I mean, the acting, it's, it's, it's insane, and to your point, I was just thinking about, like, some images that I have of, of the, on Her Majesty's Secret Service, where he does point with the cigarette, everything, and you're like, yeah, he, he's right, um, it's, it's insane, and I will have to revisit um, and and it, what's more is the, the influence and impact of that movie, right? And let's forget about Lazenby. I don't think had that movie starred Sean Connery would have had the same impact because Christopher Nolan is influenced by that movie. Um, it's it's uh, it's been re revisited, reappraised in, in recent years, and it's it's it's. I mean, it it, it is fantastic. Um, I just really don't know it's very confusing because okay would you rather see would you rather have seen connery doing it do you think that diamonds are forever is actually ruined because it it tries to tie uh, tie up all the loose ends from honor majesty's secret service but with a different bond i i don't know i think it's it's uh it, it's a beautiful accident let's call it like that <laughs> yeah i i think it if anything you could argue that to follow something as as kind of dramatic and dark as on Her Majesty's Secret Service with Diamonds Are Forever, it's borderline insulting yes. to audiences. Um, I don't really understand why, how or why they did that. Uh, maybe I need to go and do a little bit more reading. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I, 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 if anything, it torpedoes the next film. I think it would have been hard to follow full stop. And I also agree with you that to have Connery as Bond in On Her Majesty's Secret Service probably would have derailed some of the other elements. I don't know whether they would have had the same chemistry, Rig and Connery, as Rig and yeah. Lazenby. Um, and again, Savalas, I, 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 frankly, I think Savalas probably would have pulled that off anyway because it's a different yeah. sort of dynamic. But um, I think there is a genuine question, you know, a very valid question to be asked about that. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, 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 back to Blofeld and Blofeld as a character, right, uh, and as a villain. It, w- I think, yeah, it was always played by a different actor. So Donald Pleasance, uh, Charles Gray, and uh, Telly Savalas, and then someone who played him in, like, at least uh, just a scalp, and uh, for your eyes only. Yes. But um, looking at the the villains from '60s and and up until 1971. I mean, Blofeld is the face of Spectre. Uh, Blofeld is uh, the major antagonist. It's like what the Joker equivalent in in the Bond world. So, and and I'm with you. Telly Savalas ranks number one. I think um, they went a bit overboard with uh, Donald Pleasance and the whole like Scar, big Scar. I agree. It, even his voice sounds shrill compared to yeah. Savalas. That that's probably being a bit unfair on Donald Pleasance, but. I mean, how can you com- compete with Telly Savalas's that there's kind of yeah. really, you know, deep, deep kind of beefy tones? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I think the the cat and even the way that he's dressed. Now, yes, Bond villains tend to dress in a rather kind of other style that it's intentional. It's to separate them from Bond, to make yeah. them look odd, out of place. But I think with Donald Pleasance, they ham it up a little bit. And that's why, for example, You Only Live Twice, love the film, not so much for a fan of Donald Pleasance's performance. <laughs> I don't think that's his fault, by the way. No, no, no. I mean, you have six Halloween movies with him screaming around, uh, making up for his voice and um, on, on that movie. Uh, so, so yeah, he, he, he kind of made it up to, to the fans. Uh, I also think that, um, I mean, ignoring Spectre f- f- for, for a bit now, um, Goldfinger, Auric Goldfinger was a good villain. 
Yes. But he's no Red Grant. No. I, I think Goldfinger is believable. Goldfinger is a man with a plan. He's, megalom- he's megalomaniacal, but at the same time, it's not completely um, off the wall what he's proposing to do. I have bought... This, I've got, I own a lot of gold. I love gold. It's a great store of wealth. <laughs> I want to prevent anyone from accessing yeah. uh, other, other sources of gold. Um, and one of the number one use cases of nuclear weapons is an area denial weapon. Now, of course, anything involving nukes is a bit, you know, off the wall. But, you know, a l- low yield device, yeah. as he said, it would have irradiated Fort Knox for an awfully long time and would have left most of the world in hock to him. So it, it is it is megalomaniacal. It is off the wall, but it's not completely silly. As mm. a, he, he is a man with a plan. I mean, I, I, I hear you. Uh, I also think maybe it's uh, kind of still the the ghost of uh, Germany, if you will, in the 1960s uh, that they decided to to include that character. I'm I'm more partial. If Doctor No is is a bit too too cartoonish, but I'm yes. I'm, I'm I'm very partial to not to a villain that's aged very well it, at all. Doctor No, no. no. With the little hands and the flippers, but um, Red Grant, like Robert Shaw, is amazing. I think uh, he's the first. I don't know. Like I was thinking about it before we we started the recording this session and, and uh, this episode, and he's kind of like the Ivan Drago, right? Of of, yes. of its time, because I doubt that there aren't steroids or the 1960s equivalent of steroids involved in creating that perfect uh, assassin. Um, and he, um, but at the same time, he, he serves, um, well, his superiors, not, not particularly a belief, but, um, he, unlike Drago and, and some other henchmen, he's kind of like very, uh, very autonomous, right? So he, like, like his quote, my, my job is to kill you and deliver the lecture. How I do it is my business, right? You don't see... Uh, a villain that's not like a mastermind executing this with such uh, I don't know panache. I, I think he's he's a really really good villain because I think also for the moment he's set up you know with him you know with you know out there in the sun with his top off and the first yeah. thing that happens is you know he's tested with knuckle dusters. Um, you immediately know this this is a real hard case and the fact that, you know it's the criminal background who's then been brought in. Um, and the way he acts with such conviction. This is a man who clearly doesn't have many convictions, but what he does, he does with conviction. That makes him very intimidating. Exactly. Um, I mean, Red Grant was uh, was really the the one uh, after after um, after Blofeld for me. I um, I was also thinking, yeah, yeah, it's uh, yeah. You don't see that. You don't see that across the um, across other villains, especially in the Connery era, especially not with Mister Wint and Mister Kid. <laughs> oh my goodness, no! That's, <laughs> the less said about them, the better. Yeah. I, I just, yeah, it, I, I just think they were a, a it was a they were a poorly written set of characters whose they were only really there for comic relief, and I don't think that's a particularly good thing in Bond. I wouldn't encourage it. No. No, absolutely not. Um, yeah, I mean, as we look um, at the excesses of the, the 60s and early 70s, in walks Roger Moore. And I think one thing that you you just raised, and I, I it, it's very valid, is the fact that they when they cast Diana Rigg, uh, she was a veteran of the genre, right? Uh, she, was, uh, she had experience, she was known to the audience to be part of that spy uh, movement, actually a movement or a cultural genre, if you will, that uh, was taken to the big screen and pioneered by Bond. Um, and now you have a lot of copycats. You had uh, Flint, you had the, the Saint, you had a lot of other adaptations that, that started to get, they got traction because of James Bond. And at this time, Roger Moore walks in 1973 uh, to replace Sean Connery. And, I mean, overall, your thoughts on the Moore era? There are friends of mine who, for, for whom Moore is their favourite Bond. And we've had endless debates, uh, often with alcohol involved. And <laughs> I enjoy Moore, but he is a different kind of Bond. 
this is a softer, more charismatic bond than perhaps Connery. It, charismatic in a warmer way. There's a lot more quips. There are more knowing looks. Um, you know, plenty. Of, you know, plenty of you know, kind of almost quips to the audience, but not quite. Um, he's definitely a lighter-hearted Bond. Uh, part of me wonders whether, after going in with the cult, the early Cold War era of Connery, the darkness of the of what happens with Lazenby, maybe what they do with Moore is make a decision to have a slightly more light-hearted Bond because of all the anxieties that are going on in the world around them at the time. Um, another thing about Moore is is age. Um, now, very few Bond actors are young when they play Bond, or very young. But Moore is definitely cracking, you know, getting on a bit, um, especially towards the end of his films. And I yeah. think in, you know, for your eyes only with BB Dahl, that that's made explicit fun of. They know that Moore's a bit old, and if he suddenly goes off with this this this, this you know, young svelte ice skater, there's going to be eyebrows raised. So yeah. Um. I, but no, I I am a fan. I I do enjoy Moore as Bond. Is he my favourite? Pro- no, he isn't. But he he i think he in the era in which he he operates i think he's a very good very good choice mhm it, it it's very interesting what you you mention about going with a lighter um a lighter tone with the when when the when the producers cast Roger Moore because that wasn't the trend at a time actually uh, things were getting grittier and grittier and you see the whole vigilante takes say Charles Bronson, Gene Hackman, all those movies uh, that were were part of the 1970s culture, and and Bond instead of uh, I guess continuing to lead, uh, they decided to go with a slightly lighter uh, take. And I, I'm with you. Maybe that was a way to reinvent or adapt, uh, or even to to respond to um, what producers thought audiences wanted to see uh, in terms of being making it a fun bond and and i mean he he is he is a fun bond um and <laughs> i was thinking about you said what you said about bb doll uh like when he's on uh on for your eyes only yeah that was uh he he started he was the oldest bond when he uh when he be- took on the role but um yeah in terms of uh, favorite movies, you clearly mention for your eyes only. Is that the favorite one? I think yeah. There's no no point in hiding it. Yes, for your eyes only is my favorite. More it follows Moonraker, which is not one of my favorites. It brings a series back down to earth. It is a completely believable story. There's Cold War tension, and a criminal has picked up a piece of technology that he intends to sell to the Soviets. That's it. It's it, not nice. It's completely believable. Um, an exceptional leading lady, uh, you know, empowered, but you know, kind of just the right level of you know, kind of a, a, you know, attractive, stylish, very, very empowered, very focused on what she's going to do. It's also a story of vengeance for her, which is also a real pull. Um, there's the iconic Citroen TCV chase, which we've already mentioned. Yep. And again, Chaim Topol forgive my pronunciation, my Hebrew isn't so good, as one of the most interesting and entertaining allies in the entire Bond franchise, I would say. Agreed, agreed. Um, I mean, it was the first time you had an Oscar nominee, if I'm not mistaken, um, playing uh, playing um, or starring in a Bond movie, I think. Probably he was the one. Um, yeah, I mean, For Your Eyes Only is, is, is quite amazing, and Back to your point, you just mentioned, yeah, it follows Moonraker, and you're absolutely correct. But it's interesting because it also reflects a bit of the uh, the features, or at least how we get to see the Moore era, which is the franchise or the series as um, a follower, not the the leader that it once was, right? And Moonraker wasn't supposed to be the, the fourth movie. It was actually supposed to be... Um, for your eyes only, it was a knee-jerk reaction to the success of uh, Star Wars and Close Encounters. So, yeah, Bond was trying to adapt, I guess, um, and uh, adapt in, in, in a weird way to what was happening, uh, because I don't think anything from the book actually uh, flows into the movie. But uh, That's <laughs> quite interesting. It. Maybe that's something that, that flows throughout the Bond franchise, is this constant oscillation between leading and following the trends in the, in yes. the film industry. 
Yes, I, I, I do believe that. Um, because if, if we take a step back, let's see, maybe I wasn't completely fair when I dismissed the, the fun era of Bond um, during the, the Roger Moore years. Actually, quite the opposite, because you start with Live, Live and Let Die. Um, the theme song by Paul McCartney and the Wings, uh, still pretty hip at the time, if I'm not As mistaken. As Alan Partridge put it, the band The Beatles could have been. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, if only Yoko. Uh, anyways, uh, that's that's another episode, another topic. Um, but um, I mean, an amazing soundtrack. You have uh, for the first time real diversity incorporated into the movie, which is a very important topic uh, for uh, for today's audiences. But it was is actually the first time it, it started there, right? Um, you have kind of the black exploitation genre mixed in. Everything is a bit like toned down, actually. For in *Live and Let Die*, you have it deals with drug smuggling, right? And like, yeah, a bit, you're a, right. a bit of voodoo, it is very but uh, voodoo, but still, like that's that's just uh, part of the plot, not not the plot itself. It, yeah, it, it *Live and Let Die* is a really odd one because um, uh, for me, it's my least favorite, which I'm, I'm sure we're <laughs> going to go on to. But I think this is partly it's, for me. It's mostly because of Kananga. I, I don't yeah. think he is a particularly interesting villain, and I think the the way that his demise is uh, I don't want to use the word insulting, but it's yeah. kind of pathetic. I, I don't think it's the way that Bond should be going. It's borderline Austin Powers. Um I mean, there's a reason Austin Powers exists, right? Yeah. Um so you know, Live and Let Die has 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 definitely some really good qualities. Yes, Paul McCartney theme tune. The focus on focus on a non white Audience yeah. is is definitely uh, non white characters is definitely a, a good thing because I mean, previously, obviously in Doctor No, um, the, 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 there's limited elements, but it really isn't um, what it is in Live and Let Die. Yeah, no, I com- com- completely agree, and I I would say e- even more right uh, that, that movie is also an attempt to become slightly or to 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 keep the franchise relevant with american audiences which at, at the time the the biggest uh, the, the, the biggest market right so ignore the casting of, of jane seymour um well we can't because she's one of the movie's highlight but if we put that aside for a few minutes it's also very much in line with the kind of like cop i don't know kind of like vigilante movie not in tone but I don't know. There's something there that screams French connection. Um, yeah, I think you make a really good point there. From time to time, not not on a constant level, but yeah, there's still like the whole alligator thing. And uh, what was it, J G J W Pepper? Oh my goodness! Yes, uh, not a character I'm particularly fond <laughs> of. Speed um, on, no, boy. <laughs> yeah, don't get me wrong. Provides uh, he's a comic foil, and he's very good at it. It, which only makes um, the second Bond movie, right, uh, The Man with the Golden Gun, even zanier, because yes. what the hell was he doing in Thailand? In Thailand. Yeah, I, The Man with the Golden Gun is one that I really enjoy, um, and it's not just because of the, the villain. Christopher who, Lee. I mean, Christopher Lee, uh, you know, he, he really is just... It, if you have Sir Christopher Lee playing... Had Sir Christopher, yeah. uh, Sir Christopher Lee playing a villain, you know he's going to be good. This yeah. was a man who really knew how to play villains. He's got the right, the right presence, the right voice, everything about him, um, and the fact that this man, you know, during uh, filming for, for I think a World War Two related film, yeah. had to inform them. Oh no, actually, that's what that's what snapping a Nazi's neck sounds like because obviously he'd done it. <laughs> so you yeah. know, with that kind of first-hand experience, I mean, woof, that guy meant business. Oh yeah, yeah, and I, I mean, I, I'm a fan from the the Hammer horror movies. To uh, his take uh, or his his roles in Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, um, and even Bond. I mean, it was. I think he could have been Bond maybe in the sixties, or maybe he would be. He would have killed off Bond, right? Because he would be too aggressive or too. Yeah, uh, um, yeah. He's he's <laughs> such an iconic villain and horror character. Yes, having him as Bond would almost be too much. You know, Bond would become too much of a killer because Bond is a killer, but he's also. He's, all, he's, all, he's also a lover, whereas I think Christopher, yeah. Lee, was, Christopher, Lee, Christopher Lee in this case, is, he's, he's all killer. What well, was it like? Uh, Max Power, right? Nobody exactly. snuggles with Christopher Lee. You just strap on and feel the G's. Exactly. No, <laughs> I, I, I think he, is, he was best as a villain, and he does it fantastically. Even if yeah. Man of the Golden Gun is not my favorite more, it is a solid entry in the series. 
Absolutely, absolutely. I think um, actually looking back at the, the the favorite one, I'm I'm with you on on for your eyes only. It's it's really Im impressive, right? Uh, because it again shows the the beyond being a very good Bond movie, uh, it shows the franchise's ability to. Okay, let's. We went a bit too far on this one. Let's take a step back and actually produce something that's more in line with our, with what Bond is, right? Absolutely. Um, yeah. Um, I have to say that um, I do have a soft spot for Octopussy, and not because of the, let's say the the whole plot evolution or even Kamal Khan or. Uh, it's it's not that it's just the fact that it really there is something there that i i don't think it's unless you've you're a history buff or you watched uh Deutschland 83 which is the, the fact that the whole plot of the movie and the, the movie was shot in in 1982 and early 1983 released in the summer of 83 and then in september of 83 there was actually the soviet nuclear false alarm incident with the pershing 2 missiles in in west germany uh, which is not very different from um, from uh, the plot of the movie. I don't know if you agree yeah. with me on that one. No, I completely agree with you, Pedro. It, it, it is a very timely movie. You know, people living in West Germany were acutely uncomfortable about having NATO nuclear weapons stationed on their soil. Um, and indeed, you know, even 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 nowadays, there are there are many areas of Germany that are very much against it. And I believe, if I remember correctly, one of the conditions for Germany being reunified was that nuclear weapons would never be stationed in the east of the country, the historic um, German Democratic Republic. But I'm not mm -hmm. sure if they, if they actually have put them there. But um, yeah, no, it, it, it's a continuing. Uh, conversation topic to this day: the stationing of of NATO forces on German soil and, and the risks that you know come with having nuclear payloads on your soil. Exactly. So, I mean, I think it's it's a really good Bond movie, despite the the, the, the poor execution, right? Uh, or or the even some, the clown yeah. makeup. There is there are some there are some clumsy parts, and yes, the clown makeups. You know, it, it's it's fun. I, I would say Octopussy is definitely not my least favorite. More, it's probably around the middle, and it's definitely one I would recommend to to, to newer viewers if they're you know yeah. if they're going into the series. Octopussy is definitely one you want to do, want to watch. And Maud Adams, um, having played you yeah. know a rather a rather tragic character in The Man with the Golden Gun, comes back and plays an absolutely yeah. fantastic character in Octopussy. I, I I completely uh, c completely agree. She's one of my. I think that that movie ranks like number two or something in terms of Bond girls for me. Um, because yeah, she's it, great. It, it's really it's really. Um, I think that's one of the movie's highlights. We. It, it's also interesting that the Octopussy and, and for, for Your Eyes only exist between what can be considered two of the <laughs> the worst Bond movies, not only of the Moore era but also the whole like 60 year franchise uh lifetime which is uh which one's the yeah view to a kill and moonraker of course <laughs> this is the thing view to a kill it's my favorite theme song i yes duran duran nailed it i yeah. absolutely adore the song it's on my party playlist for a reason and you in fact you'll be you'll be hearing it at my wedding next year i hope uh, on the dance Fantastic. floor um Eesh. but yeah no it's uh a view to a kill it is and, and also you know the the kind of the damsel in distress element in View to a Kill is pretty grating, and I think Christopher Walken, he's a natural, um, he's a natural villain, but I'm not quite sure they they pay, they do him justice, nor do I think they do Grace Jones justice. Yeah, uh, I I think it all also ties down to to the plot, right? Um, yeah. It's, it's, you pretty, never it's a bit really zany. Get... It's a bit zany even for Bond. Yeah, z z zany at best. And you also get uh, what Sir Patrick M McNee, right? Who was all, the other or the the remaining fifty percent of the Avengers that actually well actually have the whole cast there. So I, I think that movie again, it, it's just a sign of um, why it was good to why, or why it's good to retire a Bond actor um, at the right time because then you get more. Um, well, you get more, <laughs> but uh, no, yes, you, you yes, get, you you get uh, more, uh, more movies like A View to a Kill, which is just a bit too much. I, I don't think the movie, like, will, will, will let's not say that uh, the, the main flaw sits with, with um, Roger Moore in its casting. I think it would have been a, a dreadful movie, uh, no matter or regardless who would have played Bond. I, I just believe that um, 
obviously his age, he was probably about 50, 53 or something, uh, it contributed to um, the whole cringe situation. I think, what was it, uh, Tony Roberts, uh, was it Tony Roberts' mom could be Roger Moore's daughter or something, something like that. Something like that, like, the yeah. Age, the, the age difference is just it, like... It, it was just a bit, it was, it was, it was a bit weird. Cri- um, cringe inducing, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, it was, it was definitely isn't one I would, I would recommend first that people watch. Um, I think, don't get me wrong, it's one, it, it's one, it's one of the ones I would rewatch, but, yeah. uh, you know, you, you, you have to bite your lip a bit during some scenes. That That's true. And, and one thing that I, when I was like a kid and watching the movies and then as a teen and I actually revisited because I couldn't believe my eyes, right? Because the spy who loved me and, uh, you only live twice actually share probably like 30 minutes <laughs> they have they're exactly the same movie right capturing the prisoners maybe even more than 30 minutes and yeah they were both directed by lewis gilbert but i watched them like the same sequences uh, like uh back to back in both movies and it's exact it's the same movie yeah i mean i i did really enjoy um the spy who loved me and we'll get to one of the reasons why it should be uh, seen by the fans, not only because it, it really is what Bond is all about, but also a highlight of the, the Moore era. But I, I, I just think that, yeah, that movie, that, that's a glaring flaw that it's seldomly addressed, right? It's, it's the exact same movie. <laughs> Yes, uh, I think for me personally, A View to a Kill and The Spy Who Loved Me would not rank as my favourites, but mm. I think The Spy Who Loved Me is stronger, and not just because the Lotus turns into a submarine, but that's part of it. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I'm with you there. Um, I think the it, it, it's funny because from the, the least favourite movie, uh, I, I would say probably The Man with the Golden Gun, and here I'm with, uh, with the crowd, but it's interesting that you went with Live and Let Die. And I, I, I hear your reasons, and they're completely valid. Uh, there was just no real motivation behind the whole thing with, with Kananga, and even the, the real, ridiculous way to die, which I completely agree with you. It's very cartoonish, and we need to, again, looking at it from 1972, from a 1973, sorry, perspective, um, it is very cartoonish, very over the top, and it's really, it doesn't quite sit with the movie. No, it doesn't. It feels quite aggressively out of place, which I think is probably what's put me off um, the film. But no, I agree with you. The Man with the Golden Gun is definitely not one of the stronger entries in the series. Um, I think for me, the thing that holds it together, it, it, it's it's Sir Christopher Lee. If it hadn't been for that, mm-hmm. I think the movie would have been a car crash. I mean, more, more than some parts of it already are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I, I completely, c- completely understand. Um I just, yeah, it's um, it's interesting that yeah, it's Christopher Lee that that does save that uh, the man with the golden gun. I also believe that um, it's a bit of the exotic element, right? Because yes. it's it's the first time you really, I mean, it taps into the relevance, right? That we discussed. They 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 discussed the uh, solar uh, or the energy crisis of the the early seventies, and um, and yeah kind of like an alternative plot but at the same time it's, it's very much in line with what bruce lee was just starring in a few years before he uh, that movie came out right so again it's probably a, a franchise just trying to keep up and remain relevant yeah it definitely feels like it's trying to chase something at that stage isn't it yeah yeah, I think, um, and, but they never quite catch it, right? No, they do not. Um, there are moments, and I, I mean, you talk about For Your Eyes Only, uh, it was also, along with um, Live and Let Die and the, the Spy Who Loved Me, like the first time John Barry was not asked to be a composer. And because music is, is such an important component of the, the Bond uh, world, it um, I think that's why these movies also invite you to you know, you experience something different, be that the uh, George Martin Beatles-driven uh, sound of Live and Let Die, or uh, the disco-infused uh, sound of uh, Marvin Hamlish and um, The Spy Who Loved Me, or Bill Conti, who was just experimenting with uh, the synth, as everyone was in 1981, in, uh, on her, or on your, for your eyes only. Um, so I'm I, I can completely agree. I think it was it was an era of 
change but again it's a movie that never it, it's a it's it's an era that never quite commits and uh, the, the 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 highs are are not that high but the lows are very very low i agree i, th- I think more is one of those bonds where yeah what's good is great and what's bad is pretty dreadful yeah um but that that in a sense makes him even more interesting to watch yeah yeah maybe i'll need to revisit the the more era um, and, and one thing about like we, we discussed about the the overall performance of of, of of Moore, but what's your take on on Moore as 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 a Bond? As I, as I said before, I I, I I mentioned that he was a bit of a softer Bond, a more it, it, mm-hmm. the, the movies are a bit more like relief than some some others in the series. Um, I believe Moore to be a very strong Bond, and um, if we do talk about the, the future of Bond later. Uh, after Craig, my personal view is that we are probably in need of a more light-hearted Bond. I uh, think we've he- had a lot of grittiness, a lot of stuff going on. Um, I think due to both the pandemic and um, the challenges posed by climate change, which are in the, in the media all the time at the moment, um, mm. I think we probably might be attracted to a Bond which is a little bit more light-hearted. But not, by the way, going as far as, say, Kingsman. <laughs> which some people really enjoy I personally really really do not uh, it just doesn't strike a chord with me I think it's too silly yeah 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 I mean I was trying to figure out where was it that I read uh, so Ed- Edgar Wright exactly it was Edgar Wright and the fact that I'm watching his upcoming movie this weekend he he mentioned he, he coined a term for what you just described right? which was the um the two types of bond, which was the the milk chocolate after the dark chocolate, right? How you get dark chocolate, Daniel Craig, and how we need now a milk chocolate like more. I, I could not put that better myself. So uh, you, you need to read is, that one. More is the definitive Milka Cadbury's, you know, milk chocolate. Sure, it's not always the best quality, but it's very comforting. Yeah, I mean, you need to read that because uh, I mean, it's not. It's not necessarily new or something we haven't heard before or that we don't know as fans, uh, but it never, I don't think people or anybody had put it quite, uh, quite so, in, in such a structured way, right? Uh, and it's in a very funny way. Uh, and I think, yeah, uh, Edgar Wright, who also has some ideas for, uh, for, for Bond, but I guess uh, that's been a dream of a lot of directors from Spielberg to, to, um, to Nolan to actually helm a Bond movie. Um, Nolan, Nolan can do Bond if he can actually mix his dialogue properly. I'm sick of having <laughs> to reach the subtitles every time I watch his films. Yes. Uh, well, maybe he will. The explosions will be. He, he'll blow up real stuff. <laughs> uh, let's just say. Well, actually, he would have been great because um, the protagonist's wives always die or get killed in his movies so he would have been a great choice to so helm, far, so uh, yeah, good point. to helm no time to die but here we are maybe it would have made it a better movie but we'll we'll get to that one one um i i mean one of the the key things also that we we, we discussed about the the connery era was the misogyny associated with the character and one thing i find uh about the Moore era is the fact that for all the camp and lightheartedness that we we find in this era, it's actually where you uh, you come up or you you bump into the most empowered female characters, right? And you 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 got it right, Melina Havelock in For Your Eyes Only, um, Octopussy, and Anya Masova in um, The Spy Who Loved Me. They're all like not banging the drum, but I think it's really an unfair criticism towards the the the, the franchise because. It, you do have these great examples. Granted, they're, they're, they're not the, the, the they're not they're not common, uh, but they are there. Yes, I, I think even for example, the comment you know a woman in, in Moonraker, and obviously quite an iconic line because it's just so silly. But it, it's clearly lampooning Bond's attitudes, and it's winking at the audience, yeah. saying you know yeah you know that's not how you really feel, or if it is, we're taking we you know we're taking the Mickey out of you. Yeah, um, I, I think. That resp- you're quite right. That part of the more, fr- more part of the franchise is is definitely a positive. I think you, yes, you do have some pretty two dimensional Bond girls, but the <laughs> ones that are empowered are also the best ones. There, there is a, there is both correlation and causation there. I would say. 
It's true. It's, sorry, I was just laughing because I immediately thought of Holly Goodhead. Uh, I, exactly, I just uh, don't get me wrong. It's a it's a quite an iconic thing in the Bond fran- in the Bond kind of series to have at least in the early stages Bond girls with with double entendres as names. I'm glad we don't do that anymore. I I just think yeah. I think also because Austin Powers then 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 kind of grasped onto it. You know, obviously <laughs> Austin Powers came out. I think the first one we must have been. Just heading up to the end of yeah, yeah just, just heading up. So we're heading up to the end of primary school, um, nearly about to start high school, and as a result, all our friends watched it. So because you and I have seen these growing up, we find the thought of naming a Bond girl after a double entendre to be quite cringe. It's not really something that we do. Well, you say that, but um, you still had Doctor Christmas Jones uh, yeah, around that be, time. Thing is, thing is, that is a genuinely good joke. Um, I will defend Christ- that. Christ- Christmas comes uh, once a year, or exactly you know, that. That is, I think, oh. one of the funny one of the funniest lines that's delivered in that film, and I think it's actually quite good because the name itself isn't a double entendre; it's made one by the joke. Like, it's, it's made a joke. By Fair the enough. Answer. Fair enough. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll give you that. Yeah. I um, yeah. Fine. The the Brosnan arrow is more of um, that transition. Uh, so I, I guess not going cold turkey, but even with Jinx and Die Another Day and, and before that with uh, Dr. Christmas Jones, uh, that was, um, I guess, yeah, you do have a point. But um, yeah, they, they really stopped doing that, uh, I, I guess, once we got into into the 80s. And, and, and to your point, uh, I guess the 80s, even the the... Uh, even during the Moore era, we do have a lot of... Um, like more down to earth, if you will, villains, because we do, right? You you got Ugo Drax in Moonraker and and uh, Karl Stromberg in the the Spy Who Loved Me, but even when you go to the zany uh, Max Zorin in uh, A View to a Kill, he's very much uh, 1985, right? Yes, he he's a product of that era. Silicon Valley yeah. is starting to take over the world. Little did they know. It would get turbocharged in the 2000s, yeah. Um, after the dot com bust, but I mean, the world that we live in now, I think you could you could argue is even more dominated by Silicon Valley due to social media. A- absolutely, even though if you look at be that Musk or um, or Bezos or or Zuckerberg, none of them can pull that beautiful head of hair that uh, Christopher Walken sported in A View to a Kill. Mercifully not. I, 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 I think I don't think we need Elon Musk to act any more like a Bond villain. He's already doing a pretty good job of it. Yeah, he even dated like he could get like his own uh, Bond theme song uh, recorded for him. I think he could. Uh, it probably did. We, we we'll find uh, we'll find out in a few years that there is um, a de- demo lying around. But yeah, it was really interesting to see. I mean. As a kid, I I guess I went to uh, the Moore era as it was my go-to like era, right? Those uh, seven movies um, were really my cup of tea, and I I found Moore to be the best Bond as a kid. I even enjoyed uh, Moonraker. Um, so, so did I, for the record. You know, as a child, Moonraker is very impressive. I think it's just later on when you're rewatching it as a as maybe a teen and, a, and an adult, you start to appreciate where it fits within the series. Listen, Phil, uh, let's not kid around. I think the fact that that pigeon sequence in uh, Venice. Oh my! We, we don't need to to say anything else about Moonraker. Uh, it is yeah, like one of those low points uh, of the franchise. Though the movie has some highlights, I do enjoy the one with uh, where the um, the ambulance crashes into the British Airways uh, ad in um, in Rio yes, de Janeiro. That is very very funny. Yeah, a lot of the Rio scenes, full stop, are very good, and also yeah. the fact that uh, Richard Keel uh, in the cable car sequence, when he jumped between the cable cars, he was not wearing a wire. Wow. I, that I was a know genuine that stunt. If he'd done it wrong, he would have died. And he insisted on doing it for real. And I, I'm not saying I encourage that because that's actually extraordinarily dangerous. But credit to him, he did it. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I mean, he. There you go. Uh, uh, an example of. of uh, I, I think, again, if we look at the, the villains of, of, of the, the Moore era, uh, pff, I don't know. Maybe. What? Cristatus is the one that stands out like as the. Cristatus is completely believable. He is yeah. somebody who you could bump into at a quiet bar in a port, and you wouldn't you you wouldn't even notice him. Yep, yep, um, yep. Jaws is a caricature, 
but I think that Richard no, Keel plays him well. He became um, a caricature, I think, uh, yeah. by the end of Moonraker. I think they completely like ruin it in, yes. when, when he talks. <laughs> I agree. He should never have spoken. Um, uh, and a little bit of trivia for anyone listening who doesn't know this one. When he bit into the cable, the cable car, in in real life, to make it look believable and to actually make make it possible for him to do that, the entire thing is made of licorice. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. I, I think I recall reading that. I was more focused on or thinking about the fact that uh, the the prosthetics were too uncomfortable to wear. So It was shot... more than, yeah, no more than 10 or 15 minutes. He yeah. Couldn't wear them. yeah. It, was, yeah, it yeah. looked really hot. It looked really uncomfortable, frankly, so yeah, I can completely no. believe it. Absolutely, yeah. The, the, the licorice bit, yeah, that's that's a great piece of trivia. I uh, I recall uh recall reading that one yeah it was 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 interesting and, and and again um yeah in terms of uh yeah jaws as a secondary villain he's uh, he's great you don't get that a lot in the moore era right what tee not really no, maybe what knickknack really. more tabasco uh i don't know like yeah it's a very there aren't a lot of them um during the moore era and it's something that was slowly phased out of, of the franchise and out of the um old time zaniness highs of um of the moore era we get into what we both know and we both agree on uh, was one of the franchise's highlights and not really appreciated by audiences the dalton years absolutely uh, it truly the living daylights yeah. is, is is it is my favorite bond um yes. and yeah. And that's for a mixture of reasons. It's one that you and I quote on the regular, much to the chagrin of anyone in our presence. Yes. Um, it's it's a genuinely, it's almost like a again, it's a bit of a back to basics Bond, but it's beautifully set in the Cold War. You know, the, you know, the, the Vienna Bratislava elements. The you know, physically crossing the border more than once. Yeah. Um, the, the the Soviet war in Afghanistan. Yeah. Um, I, I just think it's it, uh, it, it is a fantastic piece in the series. I think. Dalton as Bond, he's more like the books. He's darker, moodier, grittier than more. Um, but there are moments of genuine warmth and levity that help break the tension. You know, the way he treat the way he de- treats Kara, the way he treats some other characters as well. Um, but I- I've long believed that Daniel Craig's Bond ha- draws a lot from Dalton. But there is a serious difference between the two. A really key difference. Dalton's Bond does not wallow in self-pity like Craig's Bond does. Yeah. Dalton is, you know, driven. I, I don't want to to uh, to paraphrase uh, another John Wick piece here, but the the, the, the sheer will um, is definitely an element of of Dalton's Bond. I would say. But here's the thing: he does two Bonds, two two you know two films, and one I love and one I really don't. It's a bit of a shame. Oh, uh, I, I did not know. Did not know that you you didn't care much for the for, for License to Kill. See, the I I enjoy both. I I'm a big fan of the Living Daylights, as we discussed. I think um, a License to Kill again. It's an unfinished movie, or at least a diluted version of what it could have been. And I I think the movie again back to a recurring word that was used during this episode transition reinvention right um the fact that the cold war was not over but pretty much close to to an end there was a need to future proof bond uh there was also a need to play out what you what you said about making him a bit relevant or more relevant in a world of excesses which uh, i mean the stallones and uh, all the action heroes of the time right so we need to offer something different we're not gonna pump steroids into bond we're gonna do something completely different so i think a license to kill for the first time um takes bond into uncharted territory uh it's 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 very dark very gritty it's not perfect but again, it's a, a, tre- a tremendous proof of concept uh, that tries to bring Bond into not only the 90s, but also preparing him for the next century. That's a good argument. I think I do need to re-watch License to Kill. I think when I was a child, I was a bit shocked by License to Kill by the sudden change in tone. 
Whereas now, I think if I were to go back and think about the films I've watched since, you know, your Scarface and so on, yeah, and the Stallone, obviously, action films, I think maybe I would interpret it differently. Even beyond that, I mean, think of, um, or at least the, the way I always compare, uh, or, or the way I like to see uh, License to Kill. So Bond here, the Bond franchise, was a bit lagging. Right, so License to Kill is also a response to Die Hard, but mostly a response to Lethal Weapon. The first one, not the second, right? The second one was released in the same year, so License to Kill is a bit more, okay, this works, because the first uh, Lethal Weapon movie is actually very dark and has very little of the charm and buddy-buddy comedy of of the, the later sequels. Uh, and so I think it's very much, okay, this is what's working. It's the die-hard, uh, the lethal weapon genre. And again, kind of the American themes that we see in those movies. So this is, this is how we can save the franchise. So I'm not making excuses. I think the, the, the movie has its flaws and, and, and um, it, it's not perfect, not, not by a long shot. But I like to, or I like to rewatch the movie uh, through the lens of a work in progress and a transition. That's a good point. I, as I say, I think I'm going to revisit it mm. with with that in mind because you know it's. I don't think it's my least favorite. I think I've just previously. Yeah. I think I was so it was so jarring for me that I think it put me off it. But um, going back one little step to sure. theme theme songs, the Living Daylights, aha, <laughs> uh-huh. absolute. Banger! I I think with the score for Living Daylights and the theme song itself are all excellent. Definitely in my top three, probably top two. Exactly, just uh, uh, same. Um, I'm um, I'm tempted to say so. Yeah, Aha uh-huh, were the they, they were the only artists, band, performers that um, didn't. Uh, what were it? they're either American or British, right? They the Aha uh-huh, they are Norwegians, so. They are the only non-American, non-British uh, performers to ever record a Bond theme song. I did not know that. A bit of I'm trivia defi- there. Definitely going to be showing off that trivia. Thank you. There Patrick. you go. There you go. <laughs> no, no, no. It's very helpful, especially pub quizzes, maybe. Um, but but that, back to music, right? And that's the other thing why the Living Daylights and License to Kill they're so different because the Living Daylights was the last time John Barry composed. Um, a, th- uh, a score for um, for a Bond movie, right? Um, and then it, it's still very, very tradition, um, or at least retains a lot of the. Like, don't get me wrong, it's it's the theme song is is amazing and very much a product of its time, uh, but the the score and the suit it's pretty much very somewhat conservative, right? I we, agree with you. It, yeah. it, when you when you when you take it in, in in the context of the broader franchise, yes, that is a conservative with a small C score. Yes. Yeah, and and, and could compare that with the the soundtrack or the score for uh, License to Kill with Michael Kamen, who was actually uh, back to back to the reference. He was the one who recorded the uh, the the scores for both Die Hard and Lethal Weapon, right? So I mean, uh, this uh, the, uh, it's not a. I don't think it, it's a, it's a coincidence that they went to pick up, uh, or they went to recruit someone who was involved with the movies and, and the kind of character that the producers wanted Bond to become. Um, so I mean, music again. We already agree that it's an integral part of the the Bond universe, but here it's uh, like it even shows how. Two movies are, are so different, and and maybe who knows had George Lazenby starred in uh, a second movie, uh, things would have been equally as different. I think uh, Dalton's tenure wasn't long enough to to pass a great judgment. I, I agree with your take and your comparisons between Dalton and Craig. I also feel that uh, there's this uh, book that was published, uh, I believe, last year called The Lost Adventures of James Bond. And they do have a lot of uh, screenplays, unmade screenplays. Uh, but the most interesting bit of the book, and the reason why I got it, it's because it covers all the unmade screenplays uh, of the Dalton era. Or movies that would have become movies, <laughs> or actually just not words on paper, um, had Bol- Dalton uh, continued his role into the 1990s. I think that would just make me sad reading that, because I, I would have loved more Dalton films. I think Dalton is a fantastic actor, full stop. 
Yeah, I mean, he... It's interesting because after Bond, I mean, obviously Connery uh, and, and Pierce Brosnan to a certain extent, but with Connery was the most successful, had the most su- successful career post Bond. Maybe Brosnan, the fact that he was already known to audiences, right? Um, it recall- certainly didn't hurt him, that's for sure. No, no, no. But but before uh, he was already known to audiences through Remington Steel and yes. also what Mrs. Doubtfire. And I recall the meme you shared about <laughs> Mrs. Doubtfire <laughs> being the best Bond villain. <laughs> An- another film that you and I grew up with. Yeah, um, and uh, of course the the sequel, Mrs. Featherbottom. Um, <laughs> But, uh, apologies to anyone who is not in the not into Arrested but. Development. But then, no, no, not apologies. They they should be. They should be. Uh, they should be into that great show. But um, yeah, I mean, uh, more kind of like disappeared. Right? Let's go into retirement. I got my my cigars and my uh, my my um, my royalty checks. I, I'm fine. Um, Connery did did great things, uh, but also I guess that has to do with the different retirement age uh, <laughs> or the point that they left the franchise. Uh, Dalton uh, quite interesting because he's he was featured in in some movies. He was uh, this is a, another piece of trivia, and I know some of uh, my uh, audience members do enjoy uh, the last action hero the 1993 Schwarzenegger vehicle. Um, Timothy Dalton was actually supposed to play the role uh, then played by Charles Dance, right? Because they wanted to have the current James Bond uh, playing uh, the villain in that movie. And I did not know that. Yeah, that's no, no, it was it was a fact. That I think maybe I don't know if he re- resigned in early '93 or or '92. But when pre-production was announced for Last Action Hero, uh, the original plan was to have Timothy Dalton, even though he hadn't been Bond for the last three years. Um, So, I mean, with all that, uh, I think there was a lot of goodwill. There just wasn't... There were plenty of delays, bureaucracy, legal issues. And then when it was finally time... Uh, a, a, a lot of years had gone by, and and this is very different from Craig, who ha- who started, the, who took on the role at the age of 39, if I'm not mistaken, uh, maybe a bit er- uh, younger because pre-production took quite a while. But um, yeah, I mean, this is um, I, I think that there's there was a lot of potential, and I do enjoy the Dalton era. I did enjoy reading that book. It's I, I I didn't find it depressing at all. I just kind of like you know you lets you unleash your imagination and think what could have been. And you kind of that's, more, that's definitely a more positive it. spin on it. I like yeah. it. I mean I, I have read it so that at least that's how, was how I felt when I read the the story. And even the the third James Bond movie was starring Dalton would have featured. Uh, I think I think it was a motorbike chase across the Great Wall of China stuff wow. like that. So, yeah. So there were there were some great things prepared now. Would that have contributed to future proving Bond? Um, I, TBD, right? I, we really will never know, we'll and never we know, could no. we we could debate that uh, until the cows come home. But we we won't. We will actually move into the Brosnan years. Um, like the this is for all intents and purposes the the Bond we grew up with, uh, the Bond that was featured in all the movie posters, and. Goldeneye, we, we, we talked about the video game, the influence and the cultural impact of the movie. But I think and it, it's, it's a combination of actually how, once again, producers were able to inject new life into a dying franchise. And also, um, the credit to Martin Campbell, who not only once but twice uh, successfully helmed this uh, correction course. Yes, Goldeneye to start. I mean, to to have Goldeneye come out of nowhere. You know, here, here's the new Bond with that iconic sequence at the dam. Yeah, I mean, I think the moment you see that sequence, you know something's going to be something's going to happen, and it's going to be good. Um, another of my highlights with Goldeneye is the score. It's it's. I, I'm a big fan of kind of 80s and onwards industrial yeah. kind of music, and Goldeneye hits that spot. I love it uh i think also the fact that it takes place as the soviet union has pretty much just collapsed um and the, you know the way forward for former former soviet states is not quite clear yet 
um, there's obviously been widespread asset stripping and so on, yeah. um, the rise of criminal elements that to, to this day we're feeling the effects of. Um, I think it is a fascinating time to, to have a Bond film to be placed. And I, yeah, I just think it is one of the stellar um, films in the entire franchise. I think it's fantastic. A- absolutely. I mean, everything from... I, I even thought, you know, as a kid and you... What, 95, we didn't have internet, no. Uh, and uh, even 97, whatever, it was, it always felt different, right? Because when you watch the, the promos on TV for, oh, um, Sunday, this Sunday will, uh, I don't know, it was, I don't know, if it was something from the Moore era, I recall the, the trailer for The Living Daylights and uh, something, uh, The Man with the Golden Gun and, and all that. And, and then you watch the promos, Mm. Even even all the ad ad material for Goldeneye, and it felt so. Wait, I, I remember asking this question. I was probably six or seven, but this is not James Bond, right? So James Bond is something else. This is like, I didn't know the concept of canon versus non-canon back then, but I mean, this is like, whoa, uh, this is not it, right? So it it felt even to someone who was not familiar with the franchise at the time, something new, something different. And I think that was pulled off uh, with the, thanks to the combination of, like you said, the plot, uh, Martin Campbell's direction, and I guess Pierce Brosnan continuing somewhere, somehow uh, what Dalton had started. Yes, I, I think two of the highlights for me with GoldenEye are Famke Janssen. Yeah. I think you're playing Xenia on the top. She is one of the standout female villains in the entire series. I don't think there's been a better one since. Um, uh, honestly, probably one of the best b- best uh, performances I've ever seen um, in Bond. She is absolutely, she's intimidating, she is interesting, she's gorgeous, all the sort of thing. She is a real danger. She is fantastic. I think the scene where she meets Bond, um, it's Monte Carlo, I think, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Uh, it, it, and it's the, you know, how he places her accent, and then she just, they're kind of gently sparring with each other verbally. Yeah. Um, she's, and, and also, crucially, her wardrobe. Yeah, you can tell from the moment you see her in that casino scene, she's she's dangerous. She, she, sorry, you see her before the casino scene, but you know she means business. This is yeah. a danger. I think she's fantastic. And another highlight for me as an aviation nerd is, of course, the the, the appearance of the uh, Tiger helicopter, which, uh, did, yeah. which, which did go on to serve in several European militaries, and I think still does actually. Oh wow! Quite a nice uh, piece of kit. It was uh, it was impressive, and it does play uh, a critical role. In, in in the movie, uh, but let's not forget Phil, the the real hero of uh, Goldeneye. <laughs> and I'm not gonna say it. You are, General. Uh, yeah, was it uh, Alexei Arkady Arumov? Oh, I can't remember exactly how his yeah. name goes. Commander head, of head of Space Division. Head, head of Space Division. Man, uh, he, it, it's just an iconic line. There's a reason why the James Bond meme groups keep going crazy for it. Exactly. And of course, I... Alan, Alan Cummings as well as Boris. Uh, yeah, the, <laughs> do you know what? Goldeneye is just packed with memorable characters. And I exactly. can't say that for every single Bond film. Many of them you just focus on Bond himself, maybe the Bond girl, maybe the yeah. villain. No, Goldeneye's packed with them. And Sean yeah. Bean as a villain, the yeah. idea that, you know, Britain betrayed me, you know, the son, son, son of, um, of of Cossacks, who were uh, Crimean Cossacks, if I remember correctly, um, L- Lians, massacred right? by Stalin. Um, which, which is a real, which is a true story. Yeah. Um, I've actually read some of the diary entries of the soldiers who forced uh, these poor people onto trains to be sent back to the Soviet Union, um, and it is heartbreaking. Um, I, I encourage any anyone with an interest in, uh, especially post World War Two history, to give that a read. It is a mark of shame, uh, in my opinion, on the United Kingdom. Um, oh. But anyway, uh, I think Sean Bean is a, is a, is a, is a, a he's a great actor, and B um, he, you know, him he is a villain. He is fantastic. Yeah, um, I mean, Goldeneye. I was just absorbing like the the whole like forgot the the darker side of, of that movie inspired by by true events. Um, you're absolutely right. The the casting, the characters, right? It's it, everything is top notch, and to a certain extent, I think Tomorrow Never Dies would never be able to follow the excellent standards set by Goldeneye, but they do achieve something. And, and to your point about Max Zorin maybe being a bit over the top and a view to a kill, which he is, but um, Tomorrow Never Dies and Elliot Carver in particular, like they become more and more relevant and less uh, 
zanier, if you will, as time I mean, goes he's, by. I mean, he's borderline believable, given some of the stuff that we've seen, and now we're living exactly. in the era of so-called fake news. Um, and it's true, you know, if, if Elliot Carver had been in charge of a social media platform, I don't think it, this, this, this maybe wouldn't be so entertaining. I think it would be a little bit more intimidating to watch. Exactly, um, exactly. And again, Jonathan Price, a fantastic actor, he's such he range. Uh, I'm a big, big fan of his. Um, you know, that this man can play everything from villains to the Pope. I mean, he, he's super good. Exactly, super good. And even um, uh, the, the meek um, bureaucrat, bureaucratic cog in Brazil. Which is, if you haven't watched Brazil, go and watch Brazil. Don't read Amazing. a plot summary online. Just no. watch it and do not read anything about the plot. Don't spoil the ending for yourself. Go watch Brazil. And watch the uh, non-edited version. And that's all I'm going to say. I'm not even going to call the, the that version by its right name. I think it's already a spoiler if you define it. But, um, yeah, I mean... Jonathan Price is amazing, very believable. Also, it was very still relevant with like dealing with uh, the former Soviet republics and what they were doing in terms of the illegal uh, weapon sales in the beginning of the movie, and also the the whole situation between China, Hong Kong, and uh, again, it's just a movie that became so much more relevant. Uh, as time yeah. went by, and it's aged. It's aged really well. Both of them, yeah. both Goldeneye and Tomorrow Never Dies, have aged wonderfully. Uh, and to be honest, the world is not enough. I think, frankly, putting aside Die Another Day, which I think is pretty rocky, and I see, yeah. I see that as someone who's fascinated by North Korean history and North Korea itself. Um, that's a, it's, it's a bit, it's pretty, pretty rotten in that respect. Doesn't, doesn't, yeah. doesn't do it justice. But the social context of the Brosnan era, Soviet Union collapse, rise of the internet and the mass and mass media, you know, the kind of the, the media moguls, I should say, and a multipolar world where international terrorists can cannibalize the weapon stocks of failing or failed states. It goes through all of them. It's like a kaleidoscope, and it does it all pretty darn well. The world is not enough isn't as strong, but the idea that an international terrorist could get hold of a a nuclear device from a failing, you know, former Soviet republic, I yeah. don't think that's beyond the bounds of common sense. I- exactly, and that's why I also, like you said, we can talk about a decline in quality as we go through the the Brosnan era, and I- I'm with you. Like the other day is pretty much like. <laughs> Uh, basement level quality. It's, uh, it, it's it's unfortunate. Die another day. There are some elements in it. You know, I think having a Bond film that features North Korea is a good thing because they're a, they are a serious major got you a global player. And unfortunately, not not for good most yeah. of the time. Um, and I think they, they didn't really do it justice. I I think well, as you and I both know, Die another day went down the kind of the science fiction angle, ju- a bit like Moonraker, yeah. and just made an awful mess of it. Really. Yeah. I mean, it's it's exactly um, exactly. Uh, I, th- I couldn't put it better myself. Uh, it's just I was trying to think if there's something redeeming about that movie, but but there isn't. There is just uh, an abundance of nostalgia, which is something that also impacts uh, a bit. The world is not enough. But to your point, if I mean, and we're talking about the declining quality. Uh, I think it's only because Goldeneye is really strong. And the the, yes. the movies that that proceed like okay, Tomorrow Never Dies is actually superior to uh, The World Is Not Enough, but in a way they're more satisfying than um, the Craig era trilogy or story arc Absolutely. because, like you said, you have the the end of the Cold War and the the dissolution of the Soviet Union, the new republics, and kind of a new world order, if you will. Oh, yeah. That's not East versus West, but... Um, well, no, West versus course. basically everybody else. Everybody, yeah. Um, and I think it, it, that trilogy really, really works. Mm. My, my my issue is that, yeah, just really dying out today is just really too bad. I don't... The CGI, the, the soundtrack, everything is just like... I, I will defend one thing on Dino of the Day. I really enjoy the Madonna theme tune. I know that's not a very popular. Oh, you did! I, 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 thought, I, I, thought I you love didn't. it. I, I know, here's the thing: like coming from a kind of '80s pop and loving industrial kind of electronica, you know that Madonna song. It hits. It hits the spot for me. Not for everybody. <laughs> mm, no, no, no. I, I, I get you, uh, especially because I recall when the movie was released at the time. I was really into buying uh, movie review magazines. Um, I think, and I think it was Empire who, like, in their review of 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 Die Another Day, said that the theme song was the most ambitious thing 
uh, tribe in the franchise since yes. Duran Duran. I completely agree. It, it is a surprisingly ambitious soundtrack. Uh, uh, what one, although to say to move on to all the negative points about yeah. Die Another Day, I think when you are given Rosamund Pike and yeah, Halle Berry a, yeah. and you waste them, <laughs> I think you need to answer for that because, uh, as I, as, you, as you said, there was too much of a focus in Die Another Day on the CGI and the kind of the zany set pieces when what, when what you had in terms of the actual actors and actresses who are involved in it. You John really- Cleese. Let's just say it's yeah. very, very unfortunate that we get mm. the great John Cleese dragged into. Yes, I, I, obviously after the, after the death of uh, Des- Desmond Llewellyn, um, yeah. you know, to, to, to fill Q's shoes is difficult. And John, but Cleese he already did. retired. In the world is not enough. True. He, 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 obviously, yes, they, they o- always him. always have uh, an exit plan. Oh gosh, yeah, actually, I, I did. I, I've got had a twinge of emotion thinking about this. That's that, a good, that, that a good was, scene. Yeah. Um, but yes, I think when you're given a cast that strong. And you present, you create something like Die Another Day. That that's a real shame. Yeah, um, I, I, I'm with you. And when you said I'm, I'm gonna jump and defend one point about the movie, I thought it was Rosamund Pike uh, because that was something how we started to bond, Phil. It was actually what uh, she, what is she the is, yeah. she, she is she's an actress with gen with really you know she she's really good at her craft. She's got genuine range. And on top of it all, she's absolutely drop dead gorgeous, which definitely yes. doesn't hurt. Miranda Frost, she was my uh, screensaver back uh, when I had my first uh, I do not blame you. desktop. Well, it was the official one, so um, I, I was um, um, I downloaded it as as a it Bond fan. It was classy. Fan. Don't worry, it was classy. Nothing it, wrong with it. It was. It was. It was a product which was the style at the time. Uh, <laughs> download <laughs> stuff from uh, from from the, the screensavers from, from the movie. Um, I mean, when we move into the, 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 the Craig era, and we, it started very strong. And again, it's, it's, uh, we already hinted like what we both feel towards No Time to Die. But I guess it, it's the fact that much like the Brosnan era, it started really strong with Casino Royale. Right. It did. C- can I make one last point about Brosnan before? Sure, 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 please. I, I've been dying to because it occurred to me earlier today, and I've been dying to share it. Um, Brosnan as Bond, I think he was born to play it. This, this is a man who's handsome, comfortable with physical scenes, and he delivers it with real flair. So I think Brosnan is a is a absolutely solid example of what what Bond is supposed to be, and I think. <laughs> From a slightly political standpoint, the irony that an Irishman would play one of the most visible fictional symbols of British imperialism, that's some delicious irony. It really is. And he plays it wonderfully. I, 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 again, I don't get me wrong, would I, would I rate Bosnian as my top Bond? No, but he is a really solid example of how good Bond can be. Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll leave it to you to deliver the, the punchy political commentary, but... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, no. yeah, moving on to Casino Royale, I mean, what a film. I, I, I went exactly. to go see it in the, in the cinema, my jaw dropped, and I thought, wow, Bond is back. There, there have been some people who'd had doubts about Craig. I mean, there was even the, the very silly column inches about, oh, should, blo- should Bond be blonde? To which the response should have been, who cares? Um, and sure enough, didn't matter a jot. He, you know... Yeah, he he de- he de- he delivers it really really well. He looks good in the role. I enjoyed the fact that it was a hark back to the Dalton Bond, where there's some there's some elements of like yeah. emotional vulnerability. Um, Eva Green as Vesper Lind, I mean, she a masterclass yes. in how to do a well constructed, complex, compelling Bond girl. Mads Mikkelsen as a villain. Oh, I mean, yeah, Mads Mads is just great. Anything he's in, I want to watch. Frankly, yep, absolutely. But to your point, those highlights about the um, about what made Casino Royale so great, and I think it was because Die Another Day was not very well received. Um, well, we know that, I, I, and deservedly so. Deservedly yeah, ex- so. Was, exactly. It, they, they had gone. They had focused too much on look at this fun stuff we can do. Look at the CGI. Look at these gadgets. In Casino Royale, there are very few gadgets. The first thing I can think of is the defibrillator in the car. That's barely mm-hmm. even a gadget. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And it's so important. It's integral to the plot. Yeah. Um, I, I enjoyed that. I found it refreshing. Bond will always have gadgets, but they need to learn that less is more. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And, I mean, would you... One of the things that we see is that those principles and, like, the back-to-basics uh, approach that's always at the core of... Um, 
of any reinvention, we we don't we, we get to see less and less as the the Craig era evolved, right? I mean, yes. don't get me wrong. I'm I'm maybe I should rewatch it, but Skyfall I, I fell asleep, and I know it's it's very important, and a lot of people really really love the movie. Um, but yeah, the Skyfall is the one where I can say fine. Maybe I was just tired, and I never bothered to revisit it because of that experience. But both Spectra and the um, Quantum of Solace failed to, you know, do anything. <laughs> yes, I think Quantum of Solace is reviled um, or, or, or discarded is probably a better word to use. I'm not entirely sure that's fair, but it feels like a Cine Royale 1.5. You know, it's not yeah. really a sequel. It's a, here's a nice little epilogue. Yeah. And I, if you treat it as an epilogue, it's actually perfectly fine. Um, but if you treat it as a standalone film that's meant to stand on its own two feet, pretty rough. Um, yeah. Uh, and going back to what your comments on Skyfall, when I watched Skyfall, because it was such a spectacle, I didn't fall asleep. I actually found it quite compelling. I came out of the cinema going, oh my goodness, that was so good. And then I went to bed. And when I woke up the next day, I woke up and thought, that was a total mess. What did I just watch? Um, this is one of the things I think they've they've fallen for with C- the Craig era, is they put lots and lots and lots of interesting set pieces on screen. Uh, you you use the word vignettes with no mm-hmm. time to die, and you are completely right. I think you get you. I, I, I for example, maybe it's because I have a low attention span or because I just like <laughs> shiny things. But I I I felt you know because it's an assault on the senses. Many parts of Skyfall, um, and of course the departure of Dame Judi Dench, uh, which I think was quite handled quite well. Um, I woke up the next morning and thought, my goodness, what a hot mess that film is, and, and it is. Um, I went back and watched it again. Um, don't know, Adele, fantastic, uh, yeah, fantastic work with the theme song. I mean, it's Adele; she's <laughs> very talented lady. So, exactly. Um, well, we shouldn't expect any less. Um, but yes, I think. Uh, 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 however, I think uh, Javier Bardem is wasted. Yeah. I think he is bo- he's borderline a caricature. Yeah. Um, I believed when it, when he said, you know, I was betrayed by M. I want to get revenge. Good, nice, nice, nice good setup. Betray feels betrayed by her. She doesn't feel that way. But the moment he pulled out the kind of retainer of yeah, sorts that he yeah. was wearing, and he st- and the way his voice changed, um, I think he became a bit of a parody from that point on. And I just found it hard to take him seriously. And and, and that's ex- exactly um, exactly my point with the Craig era, right? You you it starts with Javier Bardem. Uh, and it carries on with uh, Christoph Waltz. Oh, and I, then what with a crime like. to waste a man like that. You know, when you've seen, in, obviously, we all saw Inglorious Bastards, yes. and we thought, who is this man? And then they they, they created Spectre and just wasted him. I mean, we were talking about Blofeld, right? And oh, uh, well, like, you didn't even mention his name earlier, which I think really says something. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, no, no, you, you're absolutely right. I guess that was part of like the gimmicky thing. Uh, people are like, "Oh, it, it is Wolfheld." Nah, no, it's not. Um, b- but again, like it's 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 such a waste, and, and that's something that's been recurring ever since. Well, Quantum of Solace didn't have a very strong cast to to waste no, it in with. It's a waste uh, cast in Quantum of Solace, unfortunately. Yeah, I think it really started with with, with Skyfall and just went downhill yeah. and not a lot of people will defend uh, Spectre but a lot of people loved No Time to Die and yeah. I know uh, uh, I mean we wanted to cover it and we also want to talk about as fans what do we want or what do, would we like to see in the future so let's take like a more focused view and just like dish out on um, No Time to Die because I, I know you also didn't enjoy or well, didn't care much for it. I, well, my fi- so for, for, for listeners, uh, Pedro and I went to the cinema with my fiance, <laughs> and so we had we had dinner beforehand, and we went to the cinema. And as the credits rolled, my fiance turned to us, thinking, "Oh, that was quite fun," and just saw me and Pedro's faces. I mean, I think if you've been able to see them, yeah. they'd have gone grey. Uh, we were not particularly impressed. But in the spirit of balance, I did write out a list of pros and cons. And there are some pros. Um, Okay, let's hear it. I I think there are some redeeming features in No Time to Die. I still believe it is a poor bond, and for reasons we'll we'll go on to later. Um, Pros, I think the score is solid. But I think it depends far, 
far too much on nostalgia. But did I enjoy yeah. it? You bet your bottom dollar I enjoyed it. Um, and speaking of all things sound, I think the sound design is good full stop. For example, when Bond um, you know, stops the Toyota Land, Cru- Land Cruiser, the fact that it creaks as, it's, as the engine's cooling down whilst they're sitting there, it kind of adds the poignancy of that silence. I thought that mm-hmm. was a really well-chosen bit. Not, not a lot of movies do that. They don't actually have the sounds of everyday life. This one mm-hmm. did. Um, again, very Bond, locales. Italy, Norway, the Jamaican club scene, really well yeah. done. Not the best, but well done. Um, and I think on the subject of locales, set design, I think Safin's lair, um, very reminiscent of You Only Live Twice. Yes. Um, if you know, effectively, a missile, it is a missile silo. Um, and the idea of it being a disputed island between Japan and, 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 and Russia, very topical. That still does happen. Um, not in the news very much in the West, but still goes on. Um, I think in terms of design as well, the wardrobe, I mean, Ana de Armas, I mean, need I say more? Yeah. Probably one of the best dressed Bond girls in a while. I'm trying to think who. But I'm still thinking. underused. Yeah, well, that's one of the that's one of the cons, isn't it? You know, there ten you minutes go. of glory, and that's your lot. Um, but yeah, her, whoever designed her dress, give that person a medal. Craig suits the man. I mean, Craig knows how to wear a suit. He looks great. Yeah. yeah. And I particularly enjoyed Money Penny's electric blue trousers in one of these scenes, I believe in MI6. That was a super good set, super good uh, wardrobe. I really enjoyed the wardrobe. Um, no over reliance on gadgets. We've mentioned it before, so I won't go into any more detail. But yes, they do not over rely too much on gadgets, in my opinion. Um, and I particularly enjoyed, in terms of the plot, the root cause of the problems in the film being the fault of M. So it's not some diabolical mastermind who's gone out of his way to create, you know, to create something truly dreadful. M has screwed up, and Ray finds. I mean, full disclosure, he's one of my favourite actors of all time. I think he shines as M, and I think also his his aging in real life actually helps with his character in this film. Mm-hmm. He, without no offence, Rafe, but it looks a bit knackered, um, yeah. and that's good. It really it really adds to it. Um, and I quite enjoyed, speaking of um, the small callbacks, although we have to be careful, they did lean too heavily on nostalgia, but when I when we saw the, the portraits of Bernard Maxwell and Judy yes. Dench, I mean, both both you and I enjoyed that, didn't we? We so did. Th- those are my pros. What, what do you think? I would I would agree. Um, I mean, obviously, Anna the Armas has, has a con that uh, she wasn't, she didn't get enough screen time. I think she... They contribute to create something that was never fully explored, which is the aging of Bond. And, and the, the only time you get that addressed directly is in the non-canon movie Never Say Never Again, the 1983 yes. Connery entry. Uh, I, I think there's, there's, there are hints, and, and that's probably what frustrates me more with this movie. There, there was a big expectation on my end to get something that was a bit... A cross between uh, a license to kill and on Her Majesty's Secret Service, but also a bit self with self referencing, you know, and getting that perspective from, um, um, you know, aging really. And I think there are like when he, when uh, Paloma and Bond go into the the cupboard to 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 for him to to put on a suit. And she's like, uh, he thinks they're they're making out. She's like, no, just to put on the suit, and you do it yourself. And even the, like, there are other hints also um, during the movie, and I, I think that could have been better explored. Um, and to your point, one of the pros were some of the best zingers I've seen in a Bond movie, and, you know, I'm talking about the desk commentary, all right? Yes, the, 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 there are some genuine laugh-out-loud movements, moments in the film, and yes, I think you and I both thoroughly enjoyed those. Yeah, uh, so, I mean, the, it's not... I think it's the expectations, right? And the fact that, listen, we were used to something great and with Casino Royale, and then we got subpar follow-ups. Yeah. And now is the time to make it up, right? Um, because, well, like we said, during the Brazilian era, yeah, there is a decline, but it's not because they're not good, it's because GoldenEye was really, really good. And if you look back... The like if you compare them in reverse order, you actually see an increase in quality. Here with with Craig, it, that's not the case, and I think that's what really frustrates. Like the fact that you you get invested into an actor, into a reincarnation of Bond, um, 
for what uh what was it 16 years yes and I mean, then you get like yeah, m most well, all of our young adult lives yeah and then you get like a send-off that's kind of like wow uh i mean it, i mean i'll say one thing it was a send-off um, yes yes just not the one that we wanted yeah i'm going to go through some of my cons but i'm sure, going to sure, do them sure. in almost reverse order i'm going to avoid the elephant in the room until the last possible moment fair enough so First Spoiler thing, alert! <laughs> yeah, well, if you, if you if you haven't seen No Time to Die, yeah. stop listening now. Yeah, um, heavy emphasis on nostalgia. It went too far. It, this reminded me of Star Wars Episode Seven. Yeah, just constant callbacks and fan service, but little new to offer. I did not enjoy Star Wars Episode Seven, and I did not enjoy this for that reason as well. Uh, it is too long. Um, I found myself forgetting the middle of the film even after we'd left the cinema. That's not a good sign. Um, I also find that when we talked about villains, uh, I think Safin's a poor villain. Yeah. Um, here's a man who's, who's created, a tr who's picked up, sorry, not created, he's, he's picked up and developed further a truly horrid weapon. And what's his plan? He kind of just says, oh, well, the whole world will live in fear. But there's no mention of his motivation and there's no mention of what he actually might do. Just, exactly. I'm going to be a man with a really nasty weapon. Well, fine, but that's half a plot. Um... I also found that uh, the handing back of the 007 handle felt very jarring. So Bond has met uh, met the new 007. They are not getting along. Um, and then after a matter of only a few, what felt like no time at all, she suddenly turns around and says, oh, give him back 007. I wonder yeah. if they cut scenes that had more explanation in or if it was just hurried writing, but all I can say is it felt jarring. It felt like, well, what's he done to earn it back from you? You, you two haven't reconciled. Um, I wasn't impressed. And we've already mentioned this: disposing of Anna de Adamas's character after about ten minutes. Yeah, she ten years ago would have been the Bond girl, the focus of the film. I think she does brilliantly in the scene that she's given. I think she is, you know empowered sexy funny all this sort of thing and part of me wonders whether they decided to kind of make it more you know i don't used to want to use the word modern by going oh but look bond bond and her never sleep together i'm not entirely sure that that's that's a great way to to push the series although that did already happen by the way in quantum of solace as you well know yeah um right elephant in the room <laughs> they completely broke the bond formula Pedro, you and I have already talked about yes. reinvention, about how Bond is constantly changing. That's a good thing. It is how Bond has survived over the decades. But to introduce a, a, a child was yeah. already a shock. And then to kill Bond off, these yeah. are two things that have never been done and should never be done. Introducing the child turns this film into a high-octane family drama. Yeah. That's the, uh, No Time to Die is a good film. It is not a good Bond. And to kill Bond off, the people I've seen defending this online are usually people who spend most of their time watching Marvel. Oh, it's okay, just reboot and start a new timeline. That's not how Bond works. Yeah. Bond's continuity has been intentionally vague since day one. I'm not one of those people who thinks, oh, James Bond's a code name. It's actually been several different people. No, I hold all the Bond films in my head together going, they're all the same person, because that's how yeah. I, I choose to believe. Because exactly. it's not that hard to believe it. Yeah. I do not think that copying Marvel is a good idea for Bond. Because then what this does is effectively opens up the field saying, yeah, well, we said these things aren't things you normally do with Bond, but in truth, just create your own universe, do what you want. Yeah. I'm sorry, this isn't Doctor Strange, this isn't Iron Man, this is James Bond. They are two yeah. different things, and if you want to do a spy film with all the things you've, all the kind of cause du jour yeah. in it, yep. fine. But it create, won't be Bond. To create your own action exactly. Here. Yeah. I, I feel I feel at the moment that with the current culture war going on um, and, and getting worse, you know, I remember when I was in the states in the kind of like not long after 2010, and the culture war was really kicking off there, and I naively sat there, and uh, as certain speakers at this conference talked about it, and I thought, nah, I don't think it'll really go go across the the Atlantic. I think this is more of an American issue. Hopefully, we'll avoid it. Nope. Yeah. We are 100% in the middle of it. And it means that every journalist with an opinion is saying what Bond should be and shouldn't be. 
Yeah. The producers of the next Bond, if there is to be a next Bond, they need to spend less time listening to Twitter and Hollywood focus groups and go with their guts. What is a good yeah. story? What is a compelling plot? What plot device are you going to use that feel you know appropriate? Now, I'm not saying that we, we want to go turn back the clock and have two-dimensional Bond girls that are only really there for their looks. But I think the idea of a celibate Bond is a Bond that is borderline pointless. Yeah. Um, Bond is a fantasy. He is a secret agent who goes all around the world, has no familial ties, and does his thing. <coughs> and I... Yeah. I, I just think that No Time to Die has salted the earth for the future of the franchise. I think there is an argument for putting the series on hiatus for the next five to ten years whilst they decide what on earth they're going to do about it. I agree. Uh, I, I, I'm i with you, and now we get to the point where we discuss the, the, the future, right? I think um, looking at the, at the Craig era and ignoring or setting aside the uh, comparison or influence of Jason Bourne in the, um, in the movies, and most importantly how they were directed and the incorporation of action sequences, especially in Quantum of Solace, I, I just really think that it's, it's all uh, a bit of a, a missed, uh, ginormous missed opportunity because there was the opportunity to do something different from a narrative standpoint to create a solid arc. And I'm not just talking about the Vesper Lind character and how she lingered uh, across f- uh, five movies or four if you, not ca- if you don't count uh, Casino Royale. I just think that um, there could have been could have been a better way, and it, it's a missed opportunity agree. to to bring something that was a unifying arc. Because I'm with you, I don't subscribe to the theory that uh, uh, James Bond is, is a code, just like 007, and that anybody can be 007. No, that's uh, fine. That's uh, that's for Reddit, not 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 for me. Um, I, I completely agree. We, w- s- one Reddit is useful, but it should be used with caution. Yes, uh, tr- thread lightly, um, but the w- 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 yeah exactly th- th- that thing right. So from a narrative standpoint, there could have been that improvement, that uh, a fresh perspective to bring something that goes beyond just one or two movies, something that spans across five and even a whole era. It's something that we've never seen, even downplaying the whole um, you know or fleshing out Bond girls to to have um, a more relevant role to have other characters stand out to incorporate and adapt Bond. I'm all for that. Like you said, No Time to Die isn't a James Bond movie. Um, it felt like something uh, Liam Neeson could have starred in. And uh, we we would... Eh, it would have been a, maybe a hit. Um, and I, I think that the movie is really reserved to people that... Uh, Maybe they're not fans. Maybe they're just this one the with the, the, the Craig era. Because when you look at people in all over Instagram and Twitters and whatnot, oh, I, I'm preparing for the new Bond movie. Yeah, by re- by watching the last four, I get it. Fine, it's Craig, so that's it. But that just shows that that's not like understanding Bond, right? Yeah, I, I it not, again. I don't want to paraphrase Alan Partridge. You know, stop getting Bond wrong. Yeah. Um, now, don't worry, we we are indulging a little bit of gatekeeping here, but um, yeah, we are. I think to you can call yourself a Bond fan and have only watched the Craig movies, but I think you will get so much more out of the series and out of the franchise if you expand to more than just that. You know, Bond has been played by multiple actors. You know, there's been multiple producers, multiple directors, multiple composers. Bond, Bond is, there's a lot of really rich variety for you to enjoy um, but go, going back to Craig one now that the Craig era is over one of my biggest criticisms of Craig, uh, not necessarily the man himself but the way that his character has been written this is a Bond that has always been uncomfortable in his own skin and it's not something Dalton did I mentioned Dalton earlier you, know, you hark back to Dalton with Craig's Bond but it's not the same and the problem is that this reflects how Craig in real life felt about playing him. After the first one or two films, he was sick of it. I think Craig is a good example of why you you, know, you should really think twice before you indulge in multi-film contracts. 
I think with Bond, the maximum you should probably go to is about three. After that, you are really running the risk of the, of the actor getting tired of it. Um, there's so many different opportunities nowadays. Uh, there are more. You know, there are, there are you know, obviously with the age of streaming, there's so many different places you can go and create good content in. So yeah, I I think frankly, if they'd stopped Craig at three films rather than five, it may have turned out better. Mm-hmm. No, I, I maybe yeah, you do have a point. Also, they they may have. <laughs> Focused or produced a slightly better second movie. Um, yes, Quantum of Solace almost feels like filler, uh, and it shouldn't. Yeah. It shouldn't. Yeah. Um, I think as well with uh, with Craig, they've incre- they, all they did for five movies was kick the living hell out of this character. Yeah, that runs the risk of Bond becoming a tragic character. Bond has tragic elements. This is a man who is an orphan. This is a man who is lonely. This is a man who does not treat women particularly well. This is not a happy man. But we need him to do the things that he can do. That's the whole point. We don't present Bond as some sort of, of, what's the word I'm looking for, a moral paragon. He's not. He is a man who does a job and looks damn good whilst he's doing it. And Mm -hmm. drinks a lot of very high strength alcoholic cocktails along the way. Um, (laughs) Exactly. So for me, the next Bond, yes, there will always be tragic elements, but I, I, we've mentioned earlier that I think, I, I personally believe, we've had a lot of dark, had some very, very dark chocolate. <laughs> it's time for a bit of milk. Yeah. Uh, even speaking of someone who's a massive Dalton fan. Um, yeah. But I think also, you know, obviously, as you said, Craig was uh, approaching the end of his 30s. I think an actor who's even slightly younger might be a good idea. Um, yeah. One... Uh, franchise that I think does really well at picking out relatively unknown actors and actresses and bringing them to the fore is Star Wars. They go out of their way to cast relative unknowns. Um, I think with Bond, that's something they should consider. I'm not saying it's the best idea, but I'm saying they should consider it. Pick someone early to mid 30s who they've done a few films, a few things, or a few series, and you think, yeah, they, 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 this person could probably do it. Um, and of course, the question: Should Bond be a woman? Nope. Completely defeats the point of Bond. Uh, if you want to do really good female lead espionage films, look at things like Atomic Blonde with Charlize Theron, yeah. which is fantastic, really fantastic. good film. There's right. loads of precedent out there for female led espionage. Go do something like that, and it'll be wanted class. as well with Angelina Jolie. Yes. Uh, Really good right. Film. No, so many great movies that have been made. And to, to your point, and as on, on a closing note, I'm with you. I think less is more in the case of uh, get a solid arc. And I know a lot of people hated Halloween uh, Kills. I think that what they're doing is something fantastic. I, I haven't seen. Well, nobody has seen the third one, but I have high expectations for it. Uh, just the fact that they create like a trilogy or an arc, right? And I think that's something that they tried with Bond they never quite achieve it. So I think, no. to your point, if they do have something more of a fixed, and even if they do then need to create or go out of their way for a fourth movie, fine, fantastic. But get get a story first. I um, agree. I think either return to the old formula of each film being a different mission. Yeah. So in other words, no no, no continuity. They could take place any time, uh, which works. It's a, it's, that's a formula that definitely works or do a limited arc. My personal preference, after the mess of the Craig arc, is to ditch the arc. Is to say, nope, go back to missions for a bit. But a, a limited trilogy, with with a few connecting parts, I think that would be quite good. Potentially. Yep. yep. Um, I mean, I have no particular picks. I, I'm with you. I'd rather be surprised like I was with Daniel Craig. Um, just like someone who's not a, not a household name. No, I think uh, all these people talking about Idris Elba, I think I think Idris Elba's got so many other things he could be doing. Uh, I think he's probably a bit too old for the part. Um, I think some of the comments, some of the discussions around ethnicity, I'm not particularly interested in. Uh, mm, Bond, no. Bo- Bo- Bond isn't you know Bo- Bond is an orphan raised in raised in Scotland. Doesn't mean he has to be a white guy. I'm not particularly interested in that side of things. Yeah. The, the thing I think is more if they were to make Bond a woman, I think that's when you really are messing about with the formula. If Bond ha- if Bond happened to be black, I don't think it would matter too much. Um, no. My only concern might be that they might have to incorporate that as some sort of, of minor plot point and I think that that would need to be handled extremely sensitively so I, you know, I, I'm Agreed. not sure where I stand on that Agreed, I mean I, I, I'm with you um, receptive but again 
let's see what what um, how they deliver um, how how they 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 satisfy the fans. That's that's my yeah my uh, biggest issue. So Phil, I mean. Thank you so much for um, once again for, for agreeing to be a guest um, on today's episode, and I'll have you a guest again once the new James Bond movie gets a release date. <laughs> My goodness, that'll be an interesting day, won't it? Uh, so I'll see you in twenty five years, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see you when we're both, you know, <laughs> approaching retirement with three kids or something like that. There you go. Okay, I'm gonna stop. James Bond will return, and so will vinyl and celluloid. In my next episode, my guest will be Liam, again, and we will be covering another long-lasting franchise, Halloween, and the latest entry, Halloween Kills. Give us a follow to be the first to listen to the latest episode. <laughs>